Hello and welcome to a new episode of the Game Informer Show. I'm Ben Hansen, joined by Andrew Reiner. Hello, sir. Benjamin Reese. Oh, hello. Dan Tack. Hey, everybody. We're here. Happy holidays! Hey! Oh, we made it! Ding Dude, dong, yeah. ding dong. Get the fireworks uh, ready! We're still here. We're rolling strong. We will have an episode for you every Thursday through the holidays because, Dan Tack, Whoa, what? we love everybody that, that we watches do. or listens to this show. That we we're do. very sweet and we're very thankful for all the support throughout the year. Uh, so we packed this show full of fun. Uh, we're talking about Below, Ashen, Dusk, what's that? Gree, other fun stuff. And then, of course, because it's time for holidays, everyone's probably listening to this driving out to their parents' place or getting together for a big big fiesta for the holidays. Right, Dan Tech? Yeah, that's, that's the way to do it. Anyways, flying or something. Anyways, so we need uh, Matt Miller in here to talk about tabletop games. Yes. Everybody's mm. getting around the dinner table. Once you finish that holiday feast, you just wipe everything off and you plop down some sort of tabletop game and Matt Miller's going to tell us exactly what game that should be. I'm tuning in for that. I Thank need you. to know. Thank Get you, ready. Dan Tech. Then after that, um, do you guys remember Extra Life in early November? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Who could forget? What a magical time of year that was. Uh, there was a very generous donor during that uh, 25-hour stream for charity we did. Uh, this, person, this person donated a lot of money to be on this show. Which is amazing. So this is Mike Hennessy, uh, and he's oh, on Mike. this episode. He I like flew, him. Yeah, he's very lovely. He flew all the way out to Minnesota for getting dinner with us, and then also to be on the email segment, so everybody be nice in the comments. Uh, but we have a good time <laughs> going through all that stuff. He has written in a lot. If you've ever like, heard us read a question in uh, pirate speak, that was him. He exclusively writes his emails yeah. in pirate speak. I ask him why. Oh. And don't worry, everybody. He isn't as obnoxious as that would lead you to believe in person. Is, just, is there an answer on the show? Uh, he talks about it. Is yeah. there a sane answer? Yeah, no, he's a oh, lovely man. Right, Very right, sane. Right. Just the best. Uh, and then after that, we're saying goodbye to our wonderful interns, uh, JP and Jill. They've been with us for uh, three, four months now, mm-hmm. Reeves? Yep. Yeah. Three months? Three months. Finally. There we go. So we <laughs> talked about... Finally, we can Felt say like goodbye. A lifetime. No, they're great. Uh, they helped out a lot during Extra Life, a million other things. They've been great throughout the entire term. And so we talked to them about their favorite games of all time. We have a bunch of basically rapid fire questions from the community, which Ooh, is very fun. Some hard awesome. stuff in there, Reeves. You Ooh. should listen. Uh, anyways, so that's at the back half of the show. But for now, uh, Below. Mm. Wow. Hey, below. it came out in 2018. We are in a post Below age. Everybody. We are. Uh, Dan Tech, you reviewed this. Reiner, you played a little bit. Is that right? Yeah, I'm. Hour, two hours in. Okay. Sure. It, time kind of stops when you play it. In a good way? In a bad way. Oh, no. Oh, so you're maybe cooler on it, but Dan, oh, yeah. you, I'm you way think? below Dan so, Tech. So uh. the thing is, like, this is a this is a very difficult game to review because it has some really remarkable, amazing things about it, I think, and it also has some really frustrating and, and not great things about it, too. Hmm. So it was really difficult, like to put together the highs and lows of, of the experience of playing this thing. Uh, I don't know. It could take a person anywhere from probably f- five to, f- to 70 to 90 hours. To, I don't know. I don't five know. Five to 70? <laughs> huh? It's, what there's the so hell? I'm sorry. There's don't be so, so accurate. There's so much variance. <laughs> like We should step back a little so bit. So, yeah, let's, let's step back. Okay, so this is uh, Cappy's game, Cappy Barra. We had uh, the director, Chris, on the show just a couple weeks ago talking about this surprising game. It's been in development for six and a half years, mm-hmm. finally out. Rogue like it is, rogue and it's sort of light. weird in that way because it is so less yes. so than other. There's less procedural stuff than other roguelikes. There are there are the rules are are much less than you'd think. Like it's not like you know this room is going to be completely different. It's like maybe there's a turn up here, maybe there's not a turn up here, maybe it's literally an ember. a turn up. You know, just various items you find on the floor or a different enemy spawn. Maybe yeah. there's three enemies. Maybe there's two enemies. It's not like but the, but the main core rooms are always going to be the same, and as you go down, and they stay locked. As you through a run, and so you're just going as deep into this dungeon as you possibly can. You do want to get to the whole goal is to go below, yes. And there's a there's a finite number here. It's like yeah, Stardew Valley Caves. Okay. There, there is a there is an there is an ending. And I, I mean, the whole game is a spoiler, so this is a difficult thing to talk about for really? the people that want to play it. Yeah, that's the whole like the discovery and exploration elements are definitely the stars of the show. The finding stuff and just the atmosphere of the game, everything. Everything acts and looks and feels like it should be there, like it's in place. And the different, uh, you know, whatever biomes or environments that you discover as you go deeper are just fantastical, wild, weird, and just 
mm, there, there's really good stuff there. Mwah. Oh, it feels everything it feels, feels like, like you had a moment. There. It feels like it belongs <laughs> in a, in a world that doesn't belong. It's just okay. it's a fantastic like feeling to see that stuff together. So it's a great game. And then on the on the flip side, you have you know this this roguelike permadeath mechanic, which is ghastly. Um, it can be it's it's not so bad at the beginning of the game. So if you're in your first few hours, you're like this isn't so bad. It gets it gets bad. It gets real bad because you need to. You need to corpse run whenever you die to get your to, at the very least. Even if you don't want any of the supplies in your body, which you do, uh-huh. you have to get your lantern back. The lantern is the most critical item in the entire game. You need. You it. literally can't see without it. Well, you can see with torches and stuff, but oh. the lantern is a a key item for in many respects. You cannot you cannot engage with the game's core progression mechanics without the lantern. So you've got to have it, and you've got to get it back. And, and just basic navigation, you need it. Or you need some kind of light to see what's under sure. you. And there, there are light sources available, but the lantern is the... You, you definitely need... Okay, you need it, okay? Okay, you need all right, it. all right. And all getting right. it back on some of the floors that are later is a real shit show, uh-huh. to put it plainly. It is... Um, ooh. <laughs> so one of the hardest you, you games you've played You can in spend hours on corpse runs getting that lantern back. I, I, th- there's a difference between, like... This isn't just straight difficulty. There's a lot of, like... You, at some point, you realize... Well, in order to be prepared for the fact that I'm going to die, I need to go harvest a ton of food and make a bunch of elixirs and just have a stockpile of goods ready for the for the scenario that I do die, and I need to go back and get that lantern. Like, you die if you go hungry. You do die if you go hungry. Like, mm-hmm. he, his stomach rolls, and then he just falls over dead. Oh, <laughs> this is lovely. And you also die if you can die of thirst and uh-huh. cold and... Uh, Later on, it's mostly probably enemies. It's harsh. It sounds like everything I don't like about life. It, it is. It is overbearingly. I don't. Again, I don't want to say difficult. It, it's these mechanics. Like they, they seem to be tough for the sake of being tough. They're not. Mm-hmm. There's like. It's not. That is not a great feeling. And it's so weird to have that with this other. With the other, like you know, the others. These other elements that are great. It's atmospheric. The music is incredible. The sound yeah. is great. Everything feels really slick, tight, controlled. I mean, it's. It handles well and everything. And again, just the experience of being in this weird world where you, they don't tell you anything. It's great. To a, to the point where you get to that, where, where it starts getting frustrating and it's just like, wow, what am I going to have to do to get down another floor? I'm this gonna sounds ha- like an impossible game to review. It was difficult. Yeah. I, I won't lie. Uh, and so you if land- you don't like roguelikes at all, there's no reason. This is not going to It's weird because the only thing that's really, that I would really consider roguelike about it is the death mechanic. Yeah, there's some some procedural generation elements in the in the world, but mostly the stuff is in the same place every time, and it but the stays enemies there. Respawn, so it's not like yeah, but the, they are, they too are predictable. Like on floor X, you're only going to see these kind of enemies. Okay. On floor Y, you're going to see it. So it's different than sort of a oh, I don't know what's coming next. You know, right. you know pretty well, you pretty darn well what's coming next. Now, Reeves, if you had to guess Dantac's review score for everything he just said, where would you land it? Uh, I think I actually know his review score. Uh-huh. So I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I talked. I talked more about the stuff that I didn't like there because I think yeah. it's important. It's not sort of not, not like a warning, but like, yeah, you've got to have a hearty sense of perseverance. In I order will to say, enjoy based this. on what you said, though, it does sound like you're in the six range. Mm-hmm. Right. The way you described it. I get it, but I didn't talk about like the the wondrous world. Okay, like when you get to the first <laughs> beach, you get to the sh- the sh- these are these are early on, so okay. I don't consider them spoilers. There's plenty of crazy stuff to find. But oh, like seven maybe. The shipwreck, the shipwreck graveyard is really sweet, Ooh, and there's 75. This, the music syncs up so nicely with every new like oh area that you approach. At least a seven five, maybe well, that, that, yeah. like seven five. <laughs> We're in that territory, yeah. Oh, interesting. So, so these elements together, <laughs> just very disparate. I've never yeah. been like, man, do I like this game? Yeah, I like it, but but I don't like this. But oh, but, seven two five. <laughs> So where, where are we landing? We landed at a 7.5. This is how we is should do right? review yeah. scores from now on, is just have two chuckleheads <laughs> we, doing commentary as we're discussing as the As he's game. trying to like figure out. Know. We landed at a 7.5. Emotions. I've never had this sort of like internal struggle where it's like, wow, I really like this stuff, but this stuff is like... Well, the core of it, would you recommend it to any friends? <sighs> with the, with, yeah, with those caveats. Okay. I'd have All to right. let them know like, this is gonna, you're going to have like some serious difficulties and frustrations, but you're there is a payoff and okay. it, it's pretty good. So Should right. I just go watch more trailers of the game? Like it feels like I get no. what I want out of Maybe it. Maybe just look at a screenshot though. and See, listen to the soundtrack. That's something you know. Having having gone through it, like those the trailer, they, they do not do it justice. Like really? the first time you get to some of those areas, it's like it really is breathtaking, and and that's why 
It's not at like a 6.5, and that's why it's at a 6.5. Okay. There's, there's, there's payoff moments. There we go. Below, everybody. Only on Xbox and Steam, right? Right now, yeah. There it is. Um, let's see. Ashen. Yeah. Reiner, let's talk about that. This is another one that seems like was all over the map throughout your experience playing it, but they revealed that this is out on the Epic Games Store? Yeah, it's out on Epic Games Store and Xbox One. Okay. Yeah. That's a weird thing. 2018, yeah, right? baby. Uh, Ashen, uh, I heard you compare it to Dark Souls. Can you say anything else? Yeah, I mean, I, I call it a shameless Dark Souls clone, and more so than any of that ilk that I've come across. Like, it's an easy thing. Like, you put Dark Souls' name on everything, Lords right? Like, that's Fallen. that's a reflex for a so, lot yeah, so, of us. So more than Lords of the Fallen and the Surge? And yes. Stuff like that? Okay. Uh, so wow. it's 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 very much the same dance, and you have Light Attack on R1, Heavy on R2. It's all about that stamina meter. You got the dodge roll for evasion. You have an Estus flask, but it's called a gourd. But it's the exact same thing. Uh-huh. Uh, you're going through the environment. It's all interlinked. You're activating checkpoints. It's about a ruined world coming back to life. There's a bit of light in it. Like all of it is like I've done this before, and I like that that dance that they have. And these guys, obviously, big fans. The developers at A44, uh, and the one big wrinkle that's different is how they handle co-op. Yes, you could call in people in Dark Souls, uh, the ghosts or whatever you call them to, to come in. But this is, you always have someone at your side. You could check a little box in the options. I want to play solo if you want. But um, the game is designed for with co-op in mind, whether that's a NPC, if there's no one else around in the game playing at the same spot, mm-hmm. or a random player that comes in to help you. So your mileage can vary depending on who that co-op person is. Like you could go into a really challenging dungeon and just die repeatedly. Your co-op guy isn't helping you. The AI isn't helping you. But your next run, you finally run into someone that complements your style of play uh, and allows you to to push forward and get through that dungeon and, and take down the boss. It's designed like Journey in that you can't communicate with them. Mm-hmm. You don't know who it is at all. Like there's no gamer tag, anything like that. So you you guys are together for a bit. You get to a point. If you have to fast travel, they're gone. If you uh, die, they're gone. Uh, so it is a very limited moment in time. And I think that's a powerful thing that this game delivers when it's working the way you want it to. Yeah. It's great. Other times they'll be like, there's a door that requires two players to open it. I go up and put my hand on it. My co-op buddy's running off into the woods. And you're like... Okay. Oh, no. <laughs> I can't communicate with him. I can't say anything. Oh, it's like, okay, I'll go back to this spawn point, activate the, you know, the bonfire type of thing to re-instance the world and maybe the next co-op guy will help me. There's moments like that where it can be frustrating. Um, the art di- design is very strange, but it works. None of the characters have faces. There's no detail. It just looks like those, uh, what would you call them? The posing dummies that animators or artists use. Oh, okay. All yeah. the characters look like that, but then they have extravagant clothing and wings and stuff like that. Um, the landscapes look like kind of like there's no detail to them, like just kind of clay crudely sliced apart and configured to look like a mountain or tree or something like that. Uh-huh. But it works, right? Like it has a unique art style that I think really resonates well uh, and delivers like a sense of foreboding and stuff like that as you move through the dungeon. And it's not just lazy. Yeah, yeah. I like I, the artist no, I, 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 I do I think, think it works. No, I do think it, it is a unique style. They went for it. They accomplished it. Uh, maybe it was a little it required a little less less work. You know, you don't have to detail a face. It's just flat, and right. there it is. Um, but I, I do like the look of it. I like the play of it. Like I said, it's it's straight up Dark Souls. This is like nine five. <laughs> uh, but the oh wait a minute, <laughs> I love that the Hanson score guesser meter over uh-huh. here. Uh, there's five bosses. All of them, I think, are unique, clever. Uh, it is a little shorter. Like, by the time you get to the end, you're like, whoa, that came up pretty quickly. Mm. Um, the, the one thing I'll say is just that, that co-op element. And here's the thing. You can summon in one of your friends. Let's say you and I want to play Hanson. Mm-hmm. you got to go in the options, turn on multiplayer filter, disable the AI companion, Okay. Enter in a friend code, like this five-digit code. What? Really? Have your friend enter it. Go sa- stand in the exact same spot in the world. Hit up on the D-pad. Be at the same point in the story, and they might spawn into your world. We just, got it. Just say you don't have co-op with friends at that point. <laughs> if that's what we you got have to go to work through. a bunch of times, and it's super fun to like go through a tower. But then it's like, 
I made progress in this one tower, got to the top room with my friend, he died, I went into the adjoining room, got an achievement and an item. He's like, okay, let's, I was like, okay, we'll do that again, I'll bring you back up, let's do it. Went back down to the spawn area, hitting up on the D-pad, he was not being summoned anymore. And I think because I made more progress in going into that adjoining room and moving the story forward a tick, yeah. it's no longer allowing us to to join or it just so wasn't weird. working anymore so it sounds like filing it's very frustrating is easier <laughs> and like trying to get co-op to work like you were showing me this at one point yeah like, i don't know why so many hoops to jump through like the, why do this the inspiration's clearly journey right yeah, like so they just want to force you down that road as much as possible but they don't want to say no to players that want exactly. to play with their friends yeah and it That's ends so up being strange. a mess yeah and you know it's the we had to figure it out going into deep well on reddit you know everybody's trying to figure it out in the PC version, it wasn't even working at all. I don't even Jeez. know if it is at this point. Okay. Mm. Uh, but so, you know, all these Xbox players are trying to figure out exactly what you have to do, and everybody's getting really frustrated with it. Okay. So that's one element of the game where it's like a real big swing and miss. Like, yeah. you see where it could be great, but boy, <laughs> it could be frustrating. Oh. And it, you're just better off. Like, we just ended up communicating through Xbox Live together as we are going about our own journeys with randoms. We just felt like it wasn't worth the hassle. Yeah. That's um, part of the narrative in its own way. But it's a um, cool game. It's, I gave really? it an 8 out of 10. Okay. Um, you know, derivative. It's challenging in that Souls way, but, man, I love those types of games, and, and it uniquely pulls it forward, and having a reliable teammate at times is, is great. Yeah, 8.0. Mm. Ashen. Ashen. Um, ben Reeves. Mm. Yeah. This came out of nowhere, for me at least. Did anybody else have Dusk on their radar? I mean, it was in early me? access for, like, forever. Is that why? There okay, was, they had, slow yeah. burn. Yeah. Okay, so Dusk, it's a it's an old Quakey Doom type throwback, huh? Yeah, it's hard to like unbundle your nostalgia for those games while playing this game because mm-hmm. it is so like in that vein. Which I feel like Strafe came out not that long ago. I feel like they're in a couple kind of in this mode, right? I remember I remember talking about Strafe. Uh, you were very excited Strafe about it was for a while. Ex- Strafe was no, what are you talking about? I gave it like a six. All right, never mind. <laughs> Didn't I? Wait, yeah. do you have nostalgia for these games or not? Yeah, I do. Okay. This one. So this game is good, whereas Strafe was not. Okay, okay. Just, <laughs> this is what you wanted Strafe to be? I mean, I'm going to let Reeves take the stage on, on his game. Here. This is exactly what Dan wanted uh, Strafe <laughs> to be. Uh, that's this, the headline. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I... Actually, just as an aside, like the... Uh, no, I won't barely leave. Yeah, it's a good <laughs> game. Um, it is, like you said, just like Doom, like to the textures, like look like an old 90s game. Uh-huh. Like, And it feels like there's no... Um, there's no reloading. There's no cover. Like it's it's plays exactly like those old games play but it just it feels so fast and like the the shooting just feels really good mm-hmm. and the guns are pretty fun like uh, you can double wield uh, shotguns there's a rivet gun that's basically a rocket launcher they all just feel really good and they have uh, enough purpose that I found myself kind of swipping swapping back to like old weapons uh-huh. and using them uh, so it's not like oh I got the most powerful gun now I'm just gonna stick with this so and the enemies are uh, walking around straightforward but uh, there's so much going on at any given time that it just it felt a little bit more challenging where you're trying to strafe around and be projectiles or dodge different enemies that are charging right at you. It, it's really cool. It's got a very dark atmosphere. It's kind of, um, I don't know, children of the corn. Or it's like it's very what? home what? country uh, horror atmosphere. Oh, like you have like blood. goats with red eyes. Yeah, it's got blood in it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, I meant the game, but I understand what you're oh, saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm amazed how much you like this game. I didn't really, I don't connect you with this type of game. Yeah, I mean, I probably have more fondness for those old st- old school shooters than I do a lot of modern shooters. I mm-hmm. still play a lot of modern shooters. Like, I loved the, was it 2016 Doom a lot? Right. So, yeah, I think that kind of like reignited my my passion for those old games, but I have a lot of fondness for just playing Doom and even Wolfenstein 3D back in the day. Okay, yeah. As does Dan. Yeah, I think I think Reeves Reeves likes those a little bit more than me today. Uh, uh-huh. To put it to put it like you know, it's really cool to see this kind of stuff. Like, it's just sort of like a, sort of like more of a project to me than like you know, it's it's really cool to go. It, it does have that same feeling. It's like oh, you got the yellow key card, the blue key card. Oh, there's key cards. There are key, key cards, yeah, okay. and it's just like you, you, it's really got that sense. Of like it's like yeah, totally an homage to that, to that sense of thing. And and some That's of awesome. those some of those guns do feel amazing. Like I wasn't sold until I got the uh, the double barreled shotgun. That thing is so much fun, just exploding stuff. Like, and it does it, it does have a little bit more of the modern sensibilities. Like you've got like the the sniper rifle that isn't called a sniper rifle, uh-huh. the, the hunting rifle or whatever. And like you can you get there is a great weapon variety. I don't know the stages. I went through. I've only gone through one of the campaigns so far. There's three, and they're pretty meaty for. 
Like any one of those campaigns could be an entire old school shooter game, I think. Hmm. In terms so it's of like length. Final Doom. Yeah, mm-hmm. kind of. It feels like it could be multiple games. What I'll say is like the later levels especially, I feel like play around with the space more and feel clever in a way that those old 90s games didn't just didn't have the opportunity to do, let's sure. say. So even though it feels like a game from the 90s, it is doing new things. Yeah. Uh, and the key card thing like never bothered me because like those spaces are so well designed that I feel like you're doubling back on purpose. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 875 for this sucker. 875. Wow. I will say, when uh, a page came out and Dan was proofing it, he saw it, was like, 875, Ben, you monster. And I was like, oh, well, I must have scored it lower than Dan thought. <laughs> I was like, oh, you uh, you like the game a lot? He's like, yeah, I like it. It's all right. I was like, wait. Would you sky score I higher? I would, I would, like, like, I was just confused with, about your expression because apparently you would apparently. not have scored it as high. As I like I the idea that end of the year for Game Informer, everybody forgot how to review things. Everyone's like, "Oh, this score is so tough to nail down this time around." Mm. This is a bundle of odd reviews, but I like it. It's a good game. You Dusk. should check it out. Okay, Dusk on PC. Got it. Uh, speaking of PC, Dan, do you have any thoughts on that news last week about Heroes of the Storm? Yeah, what about it? Like, is what it? thoughts on it? So Blizzard released this statement that was very odd, right? Because it was like... Oh, I don't think it was odd at all. It was pretty... I mean... It was pretty there safely wasn't... worded, and it was just like, yeah. hey, everybody, uh, we're going to move a couple developers off Heroes mm-hmm. of the Storm. I hope that's okay with you. Also, the championships, not so much. All, all right, right so, bye, so everybody. the cancellation of esports, obviously huge, much more than so than moving a few devs. Uh, just basically, you know, people concerned that the game is going into, you know, what, what could be called support mode. Right. You know, so it's, it's still going to get stuff, but it's not going to be with the same frequency, you know, as, as before. How much do you keep up with that community? Not very. I mean, yeah. I, I don't play that. That's not my, my MOBA of choice. But you loved days. it when you reviewed it, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it did. I still think it's, it's got great character concepts that other games haven't, haven't gone to in like the MOBA space. And yeah. It's done some amazing stuff with heroes and like. I mean, the fact that you can have, like, two characters playing this, two people playing the same hero, absolutely amazing you stuff. You can do that? Yeah, yeah, the, the two-headed ogre guy. Oh, weird. Yeah, I didn't know that was an option. two players to control one guy. That's super oh, fun. Oh, yeah, that's cool. And there's all kinds of really unique, really fun stuff in that game like that. And I, yeah. and I do think it's a super cool game. It's just like, that space, you already had two giants in that space, and it's it's tough to crack, apparently. Yeah, even for Blizzard, I guess. But it's, it's interesting thinking about them talking about ah, talent being moved off because like there were some pretty big names like what Dustin Browder was still I mean no Dust- I think Dustin had moved off already oh really some time ago yeah he's on okay. another project right 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 it seems like everyone has slowly shifted off he was a while ago actually okay yeah yeah it's weird too like this announcement came out right around if you had the same instinct but I see that and it's like that's a reminder to go back and play Heroes of the Storm I need to know that like there's something that makes a game more interesting to me when I know they're like, oh, it's on the tail end of its life. Now I, maybe it's worth checking out again. I don't see, know. I don't know if it's on the tail end of its life. Okay. It's sort of in that, it's certainly, you're right to be to have concerns. I mean, it's certainly, it's not going to be, it's not going to be receiving the, the crazy level of like, oh yeah, we got three new heroes and a new map and a new event and all this stuff like every few months. Those yeah. are still going to happen, but I'm pri- but certainly less so. Well, we don't know that though. That's, uh, that's again, it's just you have different talent on We it, don't right? know. Like, so all we can do is predict, which I'm, I'm sure, I think that's what Hanson was asking. Right? But I think like the tone of a press release. I always hate those, those press releases because it's like it's so vague that mm-hmm. you just kind of start. Ma- I mean, we're making up our own scenarios here, right? Like yeah, you just don't true. know what it's going to mean. Uh, or if it is just like, hey, these two guys are moving on to a different project. And that's all they meant. <laughs> you uh, know? Like, well, you, with you the esports thing. You don't issue yeah, that. Well, you that's don't, yeah. very clear, right? But yeah. when you hear names moving like... Obviously, it's a big development studio. There's tons of projects in the works that, we've, I mean, many we don't even know about yet. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's going to happen, right? And especially with a game that that it, it's been around that long, like so that so yeah, it's time sometimes. It's important to temper it with a, that it is speculative. But when you get a release like that, that's all you can really do from in our position. I yeah. mean, if they would they have not have released a press release at if it wasn't new. I mean, they have to make a statement about no more e- no esports for yeah, the next year. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like, yeah. It seems like it's, they felt like it was a big enough deal. Where mm-hmm. It's like, all right, we got to kind of get ahead of this and oh, say sure. this thing. Yeah, one of the strange things from our trip to Blizzard was, I think, how often Heroes of the Storm came up, like yeah. especially amongst the sure. old timers. You know, like Sam Didier and stuff, everyone's like, oh, I effing love Heroes of the Storm. I don't know if they were like just trying to show it more enthusiasm because they know like, oh, that's maybe the weakest performing of our titles. But yeah. it seemed like, especially amongst the old timers at Blizzard, like they effing love that game. Well, it's got, all the, it's got all the Blizzard characters. Exactly. How can you not love it? It's I mean, their entire <laughs> lives in one game. You know what I mean? It's like if 
Miyamoto hated Smash Brothers, which he might. But yeah, it's the same effect. I think there was one point where Sam was even uh, saying something like, oh, I think we created a new genre with that. You know, it's right, like, right, right. very uh, hyperbolic, but... Well, <laughs> it, cer- it certainly was different enough. You know, right. it wasn't just a complete right. cash in on that. Uh, it's like it's like I used to say, like, it's it's the MOBA for people who don't like MOBAs. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's I, still, the, I still think that. You know? I played it the most out of any MOBA, yeah. Well, that's why you talked about those two giants in the genre and like they've been around for a long time so you think if somebody can get in they're doing something new it's blizzard you would have thought that maybe this could have like it's found a way in there and i think it did just not enough of a way in there Mm -hmm. i mean they tried right like they tried to get the overwatch people playing it like hey get your diva skin just just play some heroes the cross promotion they did a whole new like with that that 2.0 or whatever rollout where they changed everything and you got and but ultimately, maybe they lost to themselves in a way, if you think about the history of the genre. That's where it just gets so weird. Of like, mm. well, they couldn't beat their own offspring. What are you going to do, you know? Mm. Hey, fun times. The I'm devs happy. are the real heroes. Absolutely. That's what I say. I'm, uh, I'm happy so many games are still coming out. Like, end of the year, we should yeah. be talking about, like, uh, top three forests from 2018. That is the level this podcast should be at. But yeah. these games will not stop They're coming. still coming out. Another one just hit Steam that I'm really interested in what yesterday. And I, have, I haven't had a chance to play yet. Which one's that? It's called Book of Demons. Oh. This is a card-based, oh boy, card-based oh Diablo style Give dungeon you a red crawl. Card here. All right, fine, red card it up. All right, that sounds great though. Mark Dan. it. Uh, <laughs> let's see, Dan. Do you want to clap out of here, buddy? Hey, sure. Bye, Matt Miller. Here I am. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Oh, happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Yeah, oh, man, you uh, Grinch. Uh, Time for gaming, much. boys. Dinner for me. Okay. Um, Miller. Hey. We have a funky show here rolling in. I love it. Uh, we have more little games to talk about. Little sure. games with big hearts. Mm-hmm. Let's start out with Battle Princess Madeline. The biggest heart there is. Right. Now this game, hmm, let's see. My Karnak card. It said it's like another old game that we played when we were kids, but I don't remember which one exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's which, like it's like Ghouls and Ghosts. That's it. Ghouls and it, it's like it's like a long lost sequel of that game. Okay. Which is cool. Yeah. Uh, I like, like that this game. game. Yeah, I like that game. That game. I think it's got some uh, some things I didn't love about it. Um, and there was some uh, some drama in the later weeks. Uh, if people were following along with that game, there was some drama in the later weeks leading up to release where they pushed out a little bit on the, the Switch and the PS4 version in order to patch some things that uh, were, were maybe issues that were coming up from players and, and critics like myself. Um, and questions about how things worked, and they they made some adjust, adjustments that involved um, needing to push things out some. Um, but the result did make the game better. Um, it still has some some issues around a, a sort of general sense of aimlessness in the story mode, which isn't great. That seems confusing. Just it, vague objectives, conf- or what does that yeah, mean? Yeah, there's some vague objectives. There's the absence of a of a, a quest screen. There's no map, like things like this that in some ways are appropriate to the homage nature of the game, right? Like, this is an old-school platform action game, and the idea that there's times that you don't really know what to do. Uh, anybody who played games in the 80s and early 90s remembers that that's kind of, like, part of the game experience. Yeah, press the button, see what happens. Yeah, yeah. and, like, People wander tell me around that's fun. a bunch. Yeah. And, and, like, talk to your friends and have them tell you, like, oh, no, you have to go back and get the comb and give it to so-and-so, and then oh. you can go into this dungeon. Like, there's that kind of quality there. Um, I, do they explain what a battle princess is? Y- well, they do. You are the battle princess. I am. You are Ben. Really? Yeah. Battle. They thought about calling it a battle princess Ben, but they didn't feel like it had the same ring to it. I think they're wrong. Um, but the the game itself plays a lot like that old those old school things, and it comes with both the faults and the triumphs of that um, kind of experience. Hard as hell, I'd imagine. Uh, you know, it's not crazy hard. There are some very challenging platforming sequences, but I don't think anybody's going to, like, bust their head open on the bosses or anything. Oh, good. And it's a really big game. There's uh, there's a lot of levels, a lot of enemies, um, and a lot of environments. And the game has two game modes. You can play through a story mode where you're doing um, a lot of kind of slow progression of improving your character. But there's also an arcade mode um, that's a more tr- uh, traditional sort of go from left to right um, adventure yeah and they're both cool um the game also has a lot of heart to it which i really like um it it was built in part as a um 
uh, a sort of message from a dad to his real life daughter, Madeline. Huh. Mm. Um, and so the creator of the game, um, I, I, I'll, I'll get part of the story wrong, but the general idea is that like he liked playing ghouls and ghosts with his, his daughter. Sure. And uh, she balked at the idea of there being like a girl knight who was going to go and go on adventures like this. And he was like, well, that's not going to stand. And he made this game. It's so like the Battle Princess, who is like the daughter, basically. Yeah. It's like that Donkey Kong ROM hack from a couple of years ago. Right? I don't remember that one. What's this? Where they made uh, Pauline. Oh, hmm. yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, so am I also his daughter? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, this is actually a weird kind of intervention thing where we're going to introduce you to your father in a second. Dad? Uh, it, it's so that, that dynamic of... Uh, of this kind of family vibe thing really flows into the game and it gives it kind of a heartfelt, fun okay. experience. Now, if I was aware of what episode of the GI show you were on, I would assume that this is an indie game that's going to score somewhere between a 7.5 and an 8.75. Yeah, it scored a 7.25. Did it really? Me. It did. Oh, okay. Uh, Never mind. I, um, I, I feel like uh, those earlier points... Um, pulled things down for me, right? Uh -huh. Like, I, I spent a lot of time wandering back and forth in this game. Some of that was before the patch went in that that added, like, a hint system and a little bit more guidance. But even after I then went back and played through it again with that stuff, I think some of those problems still persisted. There's a lot of places where there's, like, long uh, vertical climbs where you fall and you, you know, lose the checkpoint, you got to do a bunch over, that kind of thing. Sure. It's, you know, okay. not ideal. But there it's a neat game. Battle Princess Madeline. All right, you know a what? game. A quick cool. aside, please. This is kind of the episode of developers being inspired by other games and really showing it, like Ashen, Dark Souls, mm -hmm. right? Dusk, Doom, whatever the hell this is, and Ghouls and Ghosts. <laughs> yeah, Battle Princess Madeline. <laughs> Does that stop at some point? Is there like a year where that? isn't going to happen anymore. I, like, I wouldn't think there's so. There's too much media. Like in 20 years, people will be making like Fortnite. Like here, this is inspired by Fortnite. Uh, yeah, it's it's already happening. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's, different way. that's the nature of art, right? Yeah. Like art always imitates itself given enough time. But these are very clear. Like, right, I want yes. this to be just like this. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's gunk up those wheels then, Reiner, because here's a game that is a little bit like Journey. But a little bit different too. This is Gree. Mm. This is a game you're much more excited about. Uh, spelled G R I S, but you insist yeah. pronounced Gree because well, it's gray. You know, I haven't heard the developer say it out loud, but I went around calling it Gris for the first many months, and I was like, "That's a weird name for a game." Because the only thing it comes that comes to mind is Gristle, mm -hmm. which is like, "Yeah, it's kind of gross." It's got to be gris. Gree, which is, gree. is 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 gray in in French uh, and various other languages as Spanish? well, right? Spanish. Oh, uh, and the game is about color and about a, a girl who whose life is kind of like shattered around her and she ends up in a world of gray and is sort of rebuilding color the into her life. achievements along the way are just, you got a new achievement, red. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right, right, you got right, red, you got oh, cool. green. Yeah. Um, Wait, is there, so I've played the first couple hours and I didn't know there was a narrative in the game. It just sort of throws you in. Uh, it's a very abstract narrative. I mean, the whole game is, is allegorical, I think. And even by the end, you don't get to a point where you have a clear... Um, a, a, an absolutely clear narrative sure. where you're like, oh, now I get it. This was all about blank. I think there's ways to interpret it as being a story about a uh, a, a girl grieving over the loss of her mother. I think there's ways to interpret it about it being about man being separated from God. Like, oh, I, I think Jesus there's like, Christ. it kind of is like all over the place, right? Like It's Shades of Gris. It's Shades of Gris. Uh, but it's... Um, it is one of those games that is its primary purpose uh, is evoking emotion and making you sort of think and feel different things. Yeah. It it has some really powerful emotional beats that are purely communicated through music and through art. Here's um, the thing. It's I feel beautiful. Like we're burying really the lead beautiful. here. I think it's one of the best looking games of the year. Yeah. I, oh, think, I mean, so. artistically, maybe number one. I'm having a tough time thinking of anything that tops it. My understanding of the way that this game came together is that there were a couple guys who were thinking about like making a uh, making a game. Right. And their and daughter said, games can't look that good. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they, uh, they found this painter that they really liked and they approached him and said, we want to make a game with your art as the chief 
driving inspiration for it. Very tough when designers try and do that. Yeah, oh, that's but neat. that's what they did. It's they brought this guy in, and and the game in a lot of ways, while it has this kind of metaphor quality to it, is also just like a way of of bringing to game life that artist's particular cool. style. Yeah, and I know people have said plenty of times like, oh, this screenshot could be a painting on my wall. I really, as I was playing the first couple hours as well, this game, just stopped every once in a while just to test it. Like, yes, I would like this to hang on my wall. <laughs> yes, I would like this to hang on my wall. Like at any point, if you yeah. stop, put it on the wall. And then you just pause the game and put your TV up on the wall. It, just, right, right. And you had to go buy another nailed TV. it in. <laughs> and just to motivate you, in, in case you've played this other game, I, I think it draws comparisons to Journey yeah. uh, for, for good reason. There's clearly some inspiration that the that these game developers drew from Journey. 2D, but, though. Which you but 2D. Uh, like Journey, though, I think... Um, Gree has an ending that that catapults it forward in its value Ooh. and its and its beauty. Okay. Um, if you can, uh, for those people who've played Journey, you know what I'm talking about. That there's something that's an intangible quality in the final moments of Journey that really like hits home and uh, and speaks to your soul a little bit, right? Yeah. Uh, I think that Gree does something similar. Um, in maybe an even more abstract and unusual mm. way, but but I I really thought the 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 final moments of that game um, made me like it even more. Oh, was this I'm developed from God? Was this <laughs> developed overseas? Uh, you know, I think they. I want to say that they did it in France. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. I'm just wondering why they didn't translate the name. Yeah, because that seems like it's an integral part of the message. I I I think that they, it's not impossible that calling this game just gray in the United States might have been a better decision. Maybe they felt like they hmm. um, maybe gray to have goo a still owns name. the rights to that in some way. <laughs> like, there's been, so many gray games out there. It would have been easier to market for sure. There's or, something about like the name. Like I don't know how that's pronounced. What does this mean? There's yes. something enticing about that. I like that. that it's different. But when you started talking about the whole meaning of going into this world, it seems like that's what it should be called. Yeah. Like, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, we could piece it together. Um, yeah, it's it's very cool. It's like a it's a type of artsy fartsy platforming. That's a delight. And it's also mm -hmm. like I think it's easy for you know, a game this beautiful to fall into a trap of like, yeah, but the level design, not so much. But like the subtle puzzles along the way and stuff, I think it's it's holding up really well. I hope I stick with it. Very relaxed yeah. game. And I'm kind of yeah. interested. I wasn't crazy about it. I liked, obviously, visually, it looks amazing. Like it was very relaxed, chill platformer game, which I think I wasn't in the mood for. But hearing you talk about it, I might go finish it. What is it on? It sounds like it's awesome. Way. Steam and I played it on Steam. Steam I don't know. If it's yeah, I played it on. Oh, Steam it's on as Switch well. as well. I think it's Steam and Switch. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a great Switch. Now game. that I'm thinking about it, I, now we're talking. Yeah. It's uh, it is a great game to play if you've had a, a stressful week. I'll put That's it to you that way. Sounds like great. like it's it's a real. It would be a great holiday game actually. I oh. think like a, as an adjustment from uh, busy work, all that kind of stuff. You're trying to get in the mood for the holidays. Like sit down and play through this beautiful little game. Hmm. It takes like four hours Perfect. to get through that's great but it's wonderful yeah it's a it's the type of game where you can turn into you turn into like a block mm -hmm. to like it it's helps one of those puzzles, types of games smash yeah. through yeah. Stuff. puzzles and stuff like that but you're this giant block of a lady but if you just hold it there she still like subtly breathes yeah yes. as she's a block that's one of those details like oh that's so good it's i love really that cool. little bit i want to put that there. on my wall <laughs> 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 that's the kind of art i'm looking for <laughs> in, my, in my apartment um okay miller Right now, people listening to this are flying home to their family. They're driving in a car, mm. being attentive, hands at 10 and 2. Good. But they're saying, I don't think you're supposed to do that anymore, by the way. Excuse me? Not 10 and 2. You're supposed to just get an automated car? I think it's supposed to be on the side now, right? Yeah. Really? Really? So what? Yeah, it's 3, three and, and 9? This is, uh, this is a whole new safety thing now All right, so yeah. don't <laughs> just let go of the steering wheel, then readjust it. Put one hand at a time, going from 10 and 2 to 3 and 9, everybody. Yep. Okay, so first Down the notch. left hand, right now... And, and then the, the right. Now, is it bad if I do 230 in window seal? <laughs> <laughs> if you're on an airplane, yeah. buckle up. Yeah. You don't know when you're going to hit. You never know when turbulence. that plane's going yeah. down. Oh, <laughs> wow. Do you guys... Um, what are we talking about now? We'll get to the segue in a bit, but <laughs> are you guys also stressed out about going to the bathroom in an airplane? Yes. Because Infinitely. that turbulence can hit. Do you also like rest your head against the ceiling? I don't know if it takes a certain height to I do, do it. I do. I have no choice. I'm so tall. Right. Like, those are not I'm like large, a giraffe in there. Those yeah. are not large spaces. But I feel like the headrest against the wall, that's also just a good stabilizer. Mm -hmm. 
Well, until you think about the fact that of how many other heads have stabilized there. <laughs> well, I have a hat and I spin it around. And oh, then that's smart just, thinking. I wedge myself the in there. Just for bad I always have really bad timing because I'm always like trying to hold it in, and I'm like, I can't do it anymore. I got to get up. And right as I'm about to get up, they turn on the like seatbelt buckle sign, and the yeah. the captain's like, Hey, don't get out of your seat now. Like, I will crash this <laughs> MFing plane unless <laughs> you return to your seat. I will get out. I did have somebody yell at me actually because I was going to the bathroom and the steward was like, hey, why aren't you in your seat? I was like, I really gotta pee. And you just, you're like doing just a cartoon, like holding like, your crotch. <laughs> I, I a pee dance. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, that's it for this episode of the Game Informer Show. So no, there was no segue. The segue was, Miller, <laughs> people like board people. games oh, yeah. and yeah. tabletop games, games for the holidays. They're, they're sure. on this trip. Where should they swing by? What should they pick up? Oh, man. Well, there's a bunch of good uh, new games. So let's talk about a yes, couple new games. 2018 games. Yeah, so... Um, Sorry. One of the games I am most excited about, um, you know those things, you know those those uh, stupid internet uh, things to try to get you to click that only kids from the 80s will appreciate blankety blank? That's my favorite. You love those. Absolutely. You click on all those. Yeah. Only kids from the 80s will remember the Fireball Island commercial. Yes? Oh, oh man. One of the best. Fireball Island was this board game where you, like, uh, you had marbles that represented flaming rocks then you'd roll them down the board and knock the other players off of the board. You'd it put on it on this weird volcano-like head yes. that's at the center of the board, uh -huh. and it moves, you spin it uh, uh, to different tracks, and then it kind of, the marble will sometimes go the way you want it, and other times it'll go the other way. Yeah, it was amazing. Uh -huh. uh, and it was it was... It was this thing that everybody lusted after, but very few people had. I never had it. Yeah, I, I wanted and, it. And I played it a couple times. I didn't own it. Right. Um, and, and so I would see the commercial on TV. You got the TV. milk, but you didn't buy the cow That's for that right. lust. I got it. Um, and, oh, gosh, it was so great. And, and in, in retrospect, the game was not that great. The actual gameplay. But yeah. the game, like, the fun of rolling the marbles down was a blast. So this company called Restoration Games has this year, in 2018, released a remake of Fireball Island called Smart. Fireball Island, The Curse of Volcar. Volcar? And who's the designer? Huh. Um, I, Isn't it Davio? I don't know if Davio's on that one. I think who's so. Who's Davio? He is the board he's, game he's god guy right he's now. One of the guy? other games we're going to talk about is a Rab, Rab Davio game. Um, but, uh, regardless, Fireball Island, um, the Curse of Volcar has this quality of, of hitting all the nostalgic notes of the original, but being a great new game in its own right. You are people who are kind of like your sightseers who, for some stupid reason, have gone to this active volcano mm -hmm. island, and you're wandering around trying to take snapshots while the vol volcano is actively erupting. Uh, Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom. Yes, something like that. Sounds pretty good. Uh, so you're you're running all around. You're still you still have the marbles that are rolling down, but unlike the original, there's a much more kind of like player choice thing going on. It's not just like roll and move. You have these cards that dictate when you get to move around yeah. and that kind of thing. Um, and uh, it's just it's a great reinvigoration of this old game. Which I mean, is it filling? a gap for like the whole family is this yes. like it's not hardcore at all this is basically it's, like a sorry type game i don't think that like experienced veteran gaming groups are going to be disappointed at playing fireball island it is super simple yeah. but it's a fun time but i think kids could have a blast with this game um it has this kind of sort of three-dimensional board um that you're rolling things down there's like That's little fun. palm tree plastic pieces that you stick in the board that gives us this kind of really cool table pla uh uh, presentation. It's really neat. Um, even if you're not nostalgic about the original. Even if you're not. If you are, though, it's going to be a blast, which is why it's a great family game for, for people who are, you know, let's say they have kids and they're in their 30s or 40s and they remember these that old game. Yeah. Two really to fun. four player, 30 to 40 minute games. Yeah. It is Rob Davio. Is it? Is Code it? designer. That's yeah. awesome. There you go. And so he's like the Risk Legacy guy? Is that? Yeah. So, well, that's a good uh, um, uh, crossover then. Uh, mm -hmm. To talk about the, one of the other games on my list is another game uh, that Davio worked on this year, which is Betrayal Legacy. Uh, Reiner likes. Betrayal at House on the Hill. Um, Behoth, as the cool kids call it. Right. It's a really good game. I like Betrayal in the House. It now. is. Yeah. It's a really great game, um, but one that's been around for a long time. Uh, that It has a kind of cooperative element until it's not, where... Um, in the original game, you go, you're always going into this haunted mansion, and there's some sort of scenario that unfolds, 
and one of you is the traitor, and it breaks off, right? But this is a this is what they call a complicated game. This biz. is betrayal legacy now. Is it, it? I don't know if you'd call it a sequel, but it is a. It's kind of the same concept of a game, but built to be played over uh, a long period of time. So it's uh, a more complex sessions. version of it. It's more complicated, and it's meant to. It's something that you would you would get and you'd play with the same group a bunch of times. So whereas Fireball Island is my recommendation, if you can somehow track down a copy uh, for, um, for families, Betrayal Legacy, I think, is, is one that would be really fun for um, older families or friend groups who want to have a thing to really dig their teeth into. It's not crazy complicated or weighty, but it is, a, it is kind of like a, a deeper, honest-to-goodness like horror game yeah. that you're going into this mansion um, and the legacy element that they've added is the idea that you're going through the generations of a family starting back in like the 1600s, I think. And every generation there's a traitor? Well, every generation something happens. Mm-hmm. Uh, and legacy games are wonderful because the game itself is built to surprise you. There are well, things literally about the components that, that you don't know about as the game starts. There's things in envelopes and things hiding in the game box sometimes. So, so whereas the Betrayal core game, the original one, you play that over and over, there's 30 scenarios. This yeah. one's meant to be played kind of once because you are writing on cards, you're opening envelopes, seeing what's inside that's of it. That's the Davio special. Exactly. Okay. That's yeah. the legacy. It's like two worlds colliding, like Betrayal and the Legacy series, like yeah. Pandemic coming together. So is there a world where people should start with just base betrayal and then if they really love it, go for this funky version? I think that I certainly wouldn't guide people away from betrayal at House on the Hill as being a great game um, that they could enjoy. I don't think you need to be scared of betrayal legacy though. The the way most legacy games are built, including this one, is that you start and it's not that complicated. It kind of has like, okay, well this is how you move and this is you get this many actions and go. Mm-hmm. And you're like, wait, what, what do we do? How, how do we win the game? And literally, the game will tell you. Like, the, the, these, these, uh, the good legacy games do that in a way that is constantly surprising you. And like, Betrayal Legacy in particular does this very well, where you start the first game and you're like, I guess we need to search this mansion. I don't know what's going to happen or how we're going to win or lose. We're just going to go do it. And in the course of the first game, you discover how do you win? How do you mm-hmm. lose? Um, huh. And then in the next game, there's more things that happen. And by the third or fourth game, all of a sudden, the things that you did in the first game have changed the board in an irrevocable way that you, your unique uh, group has access to. Another group might have lost the last scenario, and they have a completely different set of rooms that they're exploring. Wow. That's cool. That's it's cool. really the, neat. The legacy games are like pandemic, def- Check that one out. This Pandemic one. Legacy is really awesome. Uh, yeah. But I'll also say, if you want something to play in a night, the core Betrayal game is fantastic. That's my favorite board game of all time. Yeah. I like a good horror game at Christmas, too. That's nice. Well, I mean, it's... It's, it's it like is, PG-13. Yeah, it's like... You'll, <laughs> yeah, okay. you'll be, you're putting down tiles to explore this house. Like, okay, I put down the tile for this hallway, or yeah. here's the study. And then eventually, you get to a, a condition where someone becomes the betrayer. They go off in their own room, read... Mm-hmm. The victory conditions, what they need to do, they come back. You know they're the betrayer. You don't know what their goal is, though. Yeah. Right. So it's more like that. You start yelling at each other. Yeah. You know, like, should we block the front door? You know, like, yeah, what yeah. is he? Is he just trying to leave the mansion? Yeah. Uh, it's great. It's, okay. So that it, it's, it's not like horror. Like, it's not yeah, horror. Like, know. like I oh. can't imagine being scared by a board. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it does. Unless it's a Ouija board, which is no. F- joke (laughs) so that's no game dude so that that is that's my my pointer for people who want something that's a little deeper they can dig their teeth into and the last thing i'd point to real quickly as being a really fun from uh fun game from 2018 uh if you just want a a kind of a fun party game that's going to surprise people a little bit yeah i'm going to point you towards the mind from Pandasaurus Games. The Mind. The Mind is a really bonkers, crazy game that the first time you play it, especially if you play with other people who've already played it before, they're going to be sort of knowingly smiling at you because they kind of are in on something that you don't get. But you should do it anyway because it's a really cool little game where um, you're, everybody has some cards that are numbered 1 through 100, and you need to play the cards in order that you have. So, like, if I have a 3 and you have a 24, I need to play my three before you play your All 24. Right. Now, these are rules I understand. These are really straightforward. <laughs> Straight Here's the counting. Thing. Here's the thing. You can't communicate with anyone. 
You can't talk, you can't whisper, you can't nod, you can't shake your head, you can't use your eyes, you can't do anything to communicate when you should play your card. And yet, it works. Totally how? works. What? It To tell you exactly how it works spoils part of the game. So is there like a punchline that once we know it, no, we'll ruin the game? No, there is a punchline that... that uh, gives you an inkling of of how it's working but even once you know that it's not like you're breezing through it what's this remarkable fun. it's really fun let's play it right now um and so you have these <laughs> you have these cards and you get to the end of a round and you survived and like they're 2 31 46 83 92 everybody played it in order and you're like how the heck did that happen yeah how did we do that because you're like the core to the rules is you cannot communicate in any way with each other about what you're what you're about to play how long does it take for a game uh you it's played in rounds to play a single round is just a couple minutes really and then each round how it gets more complicated is you have more cards you start out and everybody has like one card yeah pretty easy by the time you're in like your fifth round everybody has five cards so and you shuffle it completely you shuffle it completely miller this is insane i know i need to play this to figure out what the hell you're talking yeah, about I, I don't understand how this works i but I, I would tell you, except like I said, it ruins it. And quite frankly, uh, it's way more fun to have this tease and just go in and be like, I don't get it. I will go buy this game. It, it's, good. it's cheap. It's not, it's not an expensive game What's to called purchase. Again? It's called how, The Mind. Last question. How many players? Oh, gosh. Uh, I think I've played that with as many as five, maybe. But sure. gosh, I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head how many it supports. Um, but a, a quick look online, I think, will give you the answer to that. You know what they should do next? Hmm. Hmm. Mousetrap Legacy. Bring <laughs> back an old really, game would, from the 80s. Yes. I Mr. Legacy Bucket version. Legacy. I would Hungry, go crazy Hungry for Legacy. Mousetrap <laughs> Legacy. That would be amazing. I, Dude, that'd I that'd think fun. that would fly off the like, shelves. Just like endlessly complicated <laughs> trap. Can you get them on the phone? Like, I'm going to call Rob Davio. Honestly, I know it's your least favorite topic, but... Are you going to bring up Monopoly I am. Why not redesign Monopoly? They have. They did. Exactly my point. Did they make it like a good game now? It's Fortnite Monopoly. <laughs> they they made. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. They made what, Monopoly uh, Cheaters Edition is oh. the most recent thing. Is that more fun on a game design level? I don't like it. Have you played? <laughs> <laughs> they can do something interesting with Monopoly. Have you, know? you played the Super Mario Brothers Monopoly? All the mono Let me tell you a little secret here. All those monopolies are all the same. Oh, it's a bit of Monopoly. No, you Monopoly. haven't played Millennials yeah. Monopoly. Though. Yeah, you haven't That's... played Fortnite Monopoly. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's it's huge. What uh, I'll say is um, the Super Mario Bros. one, my nephew has it, and it's actually decent. It's way better than normal Monopoly. Okay. Really? You're, you're fighting bosses. Like, yeah. you're collecting coins as you go around, and you're using those to, like, you have powers you can use. Like, you're fighting bosses. Oh. It's actually, it has, like, an end point, so you don't, you're not playing for, like, seven hours. Like, you can play it in, like, an hour and a half. Yeah, they, they change up the rules, and it's... My daughter has a bunch of different versions of Uno. She loves Uno, but she has right. like the Mario Brothers Uno, uh, like a Milo Pony one or something. But they do different things with the cards. Sure, you know, I, it's not I just like draw Uno. four. Like they do all sorts of different things. Yeah. I like Uno's Uno. I'm, I'm Uno's not like joke. prejudiced against old games. There's a lot of great old games. I just don't think Monopoly is uh, one of the good old games. Yeah, yeah, it's well, a bad game. I mean, it's better than like a candy land. It never ends. That's the problem. You have to cheat. It has at least the trading aspect. I love the social dynamic of Monopoly, even if I, it's just long and boring. I mean, there's dice I, rolls that you're like, oh, no. I, yeah. I think Monopoly was, was... I played a lot of Monopoly when I was a kid. I, I think what rubs me the wrong way about it is that there are so, so many games now that you could share with your family um, that are miles better right. than, than Monopoly. Like Monopoly and, Jr., <laughs> and so, you know, I think that that's the thing is that like yeah. there's other stuff you should try. What's interesting is the little plug for the Strong Museum. They have like, oh, yeah. the original uh, Monopoly board mm. that was like built on this guy's like round table. And so it's like kind of a gigantic board. Hmm. But they were talking about the history of that is like the original version was designed by a woman. And then the guy took it and like relabeled it Monopoly and like what was it millions. originally called oh, I don't know it was a landlord's game mm. and it was a little more it's one of those commie games is the way they described it but they're like anyways the idea was like it was turned into the most capitalist thing possible yeah, yeah. even though the basis was 
I don't know huh. much more about sharing wealth. Well, the it's idea is some nonsense it, like that, Miller. You could play it two ways. You could play it as a capitalist, or you could play it as like a socialist. Oh, is that what it was? Oh, that, see, that kind of sounds interesting. Yeah, to me. I like that. Bring back landlords, everybody. Bring yeah. back the landlord game. Landlords Fortnite. Um, also, Miller, I want to thank you. I I feel like I finally cracked it. It's been at least three years. Code names has finally become, mm, I think, a staple over holidays. Good. Like it was pulling teeth with this family trying really? to get them off sequence or some nonsense. Yes. Finally. Code names is amazing. Yeah. Have you played Code Names Pictures? No, I was because my sister wanted it for Christmas yes. this year, and I was debating which one to get. And I was looking at pictures, and it's like I just cannot imagine that being as much fun. It's it's different. Uh, but if you if you guys have played a lot of Code Names, yeah, here's what's gonna blow your mind: mixing and matching. Mixing and matching them what? is totally bonkers because your mind thinks one way about words uh-huh. and another way about pictures. And when you try to like put clues together for both of them on yeah. either side of the you table, you just vomit. <laughs> you just literally get sick. And my family, we have a lot of wine over the holidays. I don't think that would go well. <laughs> I'll just keep it easy and simple here. Uh, Miller, God bless you. Great suggestions, man. You got it. Um, awesome. Anything else you want to say? No, I'm all done. Anything else you want to sing? Um, well, we could all break into a, cho- a chorus of... Um, no. What's your number one Christmas song? Uh... I like the the one about the ships, the three ships. Oh, uh, Leo, you want to queue it up in the booth? We're in the three ships. <laughs> what is the one about the three ships? Is that a real song? I, yeah, like I saw three ships come, come sailing, sailing in on oh, Christmas okay. Day. On Christmas Day. Yeah, uh, mine's Die Hard. <laughs> <laughs> All right, song. everybody. We have fun emails coming up with Mike Hennessy and Extra Life Extraordinaire. Stay tuned for that. And welcome back to the Game Informer Show. I'm still here, now joined by Serial Vasquez. That's me. Joe Juba. That's also me. And what is this? Surprise Game Informer editor Mike Hennessy. Ahoy me, mateys. Oh, my gosh. Okay, get up on that mic. <laughs> Mike is the lovely lad uh, who donated just a heap and helping of dollars during Extra Life to save some kids, and you donated for the one-two punch of being on the podcast and then also for going out to dinner with us. Absolutely. That is shocking. I We are so thankful. On behalf of the entire community and the kids over at Gillette's, well done, Mike. Really Yay! good. I'm thankful for you guys for putting that on and just making that even a possibility. Okay, so here's the question, though. Absolutely. What compelled you to donate so much, and how do we convince other people to do that? Um, so it's like a combination of things. I, I really enjoy Game Informer. You guys have uh, really um, got me out of some good uh, stressful times and all that stuff. And um, But I'm also, you know, I, I've been in the hospital before, and it, I think it's really important to when I was a kid. So I think it's important to um, sort of pay that forward and the fact that you guys put on a platform for doing that. It's like a win-win, win, com- uh, you know, sure. situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except for the fact that you have to have dinner with Ben Hansen. <laughs> right. I'm going to be very obnoxious. I also like uh, chewing with my mouth open, so I hope that's all right. Uh, what do you think we can do better for next year's Extra Life? Mm. More singing, less singing. No. Less I think, I, improv. I think that's pretty on point. Um, okay. I don't know. You guys did a pretty fantastic job this oh, year. Oh, gosh. Um, thanks, Mike. M- maybe, maybe some more shaved heads. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I guess everybody here is already good it's to go. It's slowly but, uh, growing back. Yeah, yeah, it's getting to the point where it's maybe doable. Although Brian Shea just got his first haircut post-Extra Life, so he's already taken the plunge. He kind of mohawked it. Yeah, I don't know what he's doing. Did you understand what he was doing with his hair, Mike? No, not really. Okay, I'm very confused. Now, he experiments mo- with his hair, I think, probably more than any other... GI staff member. That's true. Now, Mike Hennessy, is that how you pronounce the last name? Absolutely. Uh, listeners of the show might recognize you from your hot email of the week win back from the start of this year. I went back to the archives and see, like, is Mike ever won? What's going on here? You sent in just a killer email yeah. about saying, hey, where are all the Harry Potter games? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, and you yep, won yep. email of the week for that one. Yeah, yep, yep. yep and yep. now there was that crazy leak where it looks like Avalanche is making that Harry Potter game. Did you watch that? Yeah, I did, and I was, like, pretty uh, excited about that because, um, yeah, I mean, I, it's just been a hot minute, and then I was like... Yeah, that's 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 pretty awesome that we're starting to get some stuff. They're also coming out with that mobile game. Uh, there's a mobile that Harry Potter mobile game they that's coming out. Some it. Tune. It's about time to show that stuff off. I feel like Fantastic Beasts is already out of the theaters at this point, isn't it? Like, did okay. that ever come in the theaters? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> Certainly, no one I know talked about it. Leo did wow. you effectively see it? dodged the theaters. Yeah. <laughs> I did not see it. And you're a Harry Potter lad, right? Sure. I like the world more than I've liked any of the movies. Huh. 
That Did sounds you like a real books? money maker for the Wizarding World. I was, I was the most into the game, so I'm excited for a new game. Mm, we'll see how it goes. So when searching back through your um, podcast at com history, mm-hmm. there's something very striking, Mike. What's that? <laughs> you, you've hinted at several times in your visit already as you're walking around. You only speak in a pirate tone when you write in. <laughs> Why do you do this? Why do you make us speak like pirates? And time? will you please I, stop? I think, <laughs> I, I, I think it's a fun theme, you know? You got, like you always try, try to make some a little bit more interesting than just ask, posing a question. Sometimes you can add a little bit more flavor to it. Wait a minute. Now I'm, piece, it fun. I'm piecing things together because earlier you were talking about model building and you mentioned the Black Pearl as well. Are you just super into pirates? <laughs> no, it was, that was actually a gift because, uh, uh-huh. I don't know, my coworkers, they, they, I, I, I say ahoy a lot and all that stuff. And and uh, I, I try to make it a uh, pretty uh, pleasant at work and easygoing. So um, the lingo helps, and then just people just, uh, you know. Okay. I will say, I don't think that a "Hey, where are all the Harry Potter games?" email would have won email of the week if it were just a straight up normal. Oh, worded you email. think the theme pushed over that? Don't tell people that are listening <laughs> that joke. <laughs> no linguistical theme will push you over. I'm the writing head. all my emails in Limerick. <laughs> uh, we should remind people this is podcastagameformer.com. Uh, we're going to read off some wonderful emails and choose our absolute favorite. Mike's going to help with all that. So podcastagainformer.com, send in. What should they send in, Mike? Um, everything that will make the show better. Yeah! yeah. There we go. Ooh. Also, Questions I want to make sure we don't just gloss over what Surreal suggested. Right? Send emails in in Limerick. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hell we're, yeah. Absolutely. We could do a Make whole, the show better. There could be a whole section <laughs> of just like, hey, for the next three questions, they are Limerick-only based <laughs> Question. Email segment what, the musical. Whatever yeah. you guys want. Let's do it. All right. We have emails here. This is how it works, Mike. I print these out, and then I read them off. The highlighted ones, I give a heads up because they're tricky. All right. Ready for this? Joseph Targos says, has there ever been a harder game of the year decision than picking between God of War and Red Dead 2? I keep flipping back and forth and just can't decide. God of War is the most perfectly executed and realized artistic vision I've ever experienced in a video game, but Red Dead... Uh, two undoubtedly is more ambitious and staggeringly well done, even when you consider its flaws. I know Game of the Year is just an arbitrary nothing, but I feel strangely compelled to make a choice still. You guys ever consider a tie? Uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but no, we haven't considered a tie. <laughs> but of all the years, this is the year where I feel like it should have happened. But where do you stand, Mike, on, on this classic debate? Um... It's an interesting question because in the past I've actually tied like the last generation of my favorite games be- between Mass Effect and Red Dead Redemption. Oh. But for like this year, I would distinctly give it to God of War. Really? Did He's you play easily. through Red Dead too? Yeah, uh, I, I'm in the third chapter, but it's such a slow burn, and because I've had a lot to do, yeah. I, I haven't quite uh, finished it yet. Maybe that'll change. It I, could change. I recommend finishing it. I recommend finishing it, but I feel like by the third, by chapter three, you have an idea of like what's making that game good. I think like the three to four is when I fully fell in that groove. You know what I mean? So give it a little more time maybe. But it is, it's the classic debate this year, I feel like, between wildly ambitious God of War and rock solid versus stupidly huge ambitious and a little rickety around the edge with Red Dead 2. And that's just, that's a tough call to make. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I mean, the he, he called out in the question too, like ultimately... Game of the year decision is something that like we as, as an organization make mm-hmm. because it's, you know, it's a it's a fun way to like put out a list, but in terms of like personal like it's okay to enjoy two games the same for different reasons. No, and no like, Joe, we need to come no, up with our he ranking. He points it out in the question though. And I Yeah, th- and, and he says it's an arbitrary nothing, but still, you have to make a choice, especially for us when we have to make these top 10 lists. <laughs> And I don't ever look back at my list from 2011 and feel guilty about it or anything, but I might. And knowing that, like, if I don't make the right call right now for 2018, I might look back and be like, what was I thinking? Of course God of War, or of course Red Dead is yeah. more fond in my heart. It's very tough. It's a super tough year. But Game Informer has made our choice. You can find out what it is in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Though I suppose more to the, like, partially to the crux of the question there, too. Like, this is... I think the closest we've ever been to to a tie uh, i don't know but it well okay this is the closest we've been to a tie between two games that everyone generally yes, loves. mutual respect yeah yes and not just hating and screaming not yeah. the year when yeah there were like two games up for it and half the room thought one game was garbage and one was great and right. vice versa. yes yeah. absolutely uh tom from redmond washington 
than Tom was like in the comments. He always writes in for the developer Q&A questions on the podcast. It's always fun reading his name. Anyways, hi, Tom. He says, hey, Ben, GI, Leo in the booth. Hello. Okay, great. Uh, he says, congrats to God of War for winning Game of the Year at the Keeleys. Uh, but here's a question. What the heck are they going to do with the Game of the Year edition? There's no DLC. But they have to make a Game of the Year edition for God of War, right? They can put, one? this one's got New Game Plus on the box. <laughs> Only in this bundle. Yeah. I guess, do you have to release a Game of the Year edition? They probably will. It'll, I, they Just could, like a discount price version? Yeah, they could say, like, this is the $30, $20 version. It's, it has, it's branded as Game of the Year edition. Aren't they doing um, greatest hits like, or oh, on the PlayStation yeah. Store now? Yeah. I mean, I think it's already down to... I think it's God of War is already, like, 40 bucks, or it was during the, like, uh, Black Friday sales. Okay, and stuff, that crazy so. sale. For PSN. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know, man. Joe, you were convinced they were going to do DLC for a while, weren't you? Yeah, I'm less convinced now because they haven't. <laughs> they, they, they haven't because they anything. haven't released yeah. DLC. Um, well, no, but I mean, they, they haven't even talked about it. Really, right, you know? right. And like, I think I was more convinced because I thought they would be following more closely this the uh, Horizon Zero Dawn model of. Something comes out, it's a big success, and then you strike while the iron's hot and get more of it. Frozen Wild stuff. But instead of doing that, they took a different approach, which I've appreciated just as much, which was like some pretty regular and substantial updates to the game. You know, adding nothing too crazy, just new game plus, right? Yeah, a couple items here and there, but it's not been like a living game by any means. It no. feels like that's what I love about that game in a way. It's just like this rock of like, here is the game, the right. experience, but now I we're mean, stepping away. Remember, photo mode wasn't in there when it when that's it true. first launched either. So it's first photo mode, then new game plus. There were some like gameplay tweaks along the way also. So yeah. it is crazy that in 2018, one of the biggest games of the year can release and it's just like, no, no microtransactions, no DLC even. Like we're so cozy and comfortable. And I love that financially... I don't know. I'd imagine it's made its money back now at this point. I don't know how many copies it's at. Eight million, something like that. But hmm. there's also something maybe figuring into it is the idea that because God of War is sort of a reboot and they want they want to sort of return the franchise back to I don't know, being more cutting edge, yeah. I guess. They don't want to over gimmick it, maybe. Yeah, like maybe they feel like to 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 get back in people's sort of good graces. They just need to be like, we are delivering a super polished experience with free content. What you see is what you get. Yeah. We're not going to you know, push, uh, push our luck by trying to make people feel like they're being exploited. But I think they could have, and I don't think people would have been outraged. It's the standard to have companies push yeah. their luck. That's at, what's so crazy. At the same time, though, I've, what if they had said, oh, okay, here's a new area, like, Frozen, Frozen Wilds version of God of War, or like here's more sort of like variety or levels in some of like the post game stuff of like we've added additional levels to these trial areas. Like they could have done stuff like that, totally, but they, but they didn't. Yeah, which, which is a, yeah, which is like interesting. It's uh, like the the exception now versus the yeah. rule. I guess ultimately, I think maybe they thought it was better to instead of adding more of the same, even to just let the experience as it released sort of speak yeah. for itself. Yeah. But. Joe, do you think, um, do you remember how much you liked that game? Did you have to go back and like double check? Like, oh, what did I feel about this game? I did go back and start a new game plus and play for about an hour or two. Yeah. It is real good. Uh, very good. Standing by your 975? Yeah. Anything you'd like to change at this point? About the review? Yes. No. <laughs> okay. No. All right. No, standing by that. All right. Though I will say I, I would not have given Red Dead the 10 that it got either. Oh, so. Matt Burt's reviewed that. Right. Okay. Which is, uh, that's nothing against it. I probably would have given that a 975 also. So mm-hmm. sort of a very even playing field for me score wise. Very convenient. But. Every game Joe played this year, 975. <laughs> uh, hello, Game Informer crew and host. Hello. Uh, this is from Walters. Says, hey, last week someone wrote in about purchasing a classic console and if there's any appeal. I purchased both the NES and Super Nintendo Classic for the controller. There's something about the feel of the original controller that makes the experience so much better. Even though I never experienced those generations firsthand, using the original controller just seems right. As if using a controller that the game was not designed for is somehow wrong. And yes, I wanted an N64 Classic for that sweet, sweet proprietary controller. Am I crazy? Does anyone else feel this way? I totally get it. There's something about it. Even though I'm totally with you, I didn't play a lot of NES or Super Nintendo. Like, there's something about picking up that controller and playing those games with that. We're just there's something 
magical. D- I think even divorced from nostalgia, there's some great connection to that. Just knowing the designers are working around this specific piece of hardware, you know? Yeah, no- normally I-, I-, I would have disagreed and said like, yeah, just play with whatever you want until I played the PC version of Killer7 this year. Because <laughs> like that, that game was built around the GameCube controller specifically. Yeah. And so like playing it with like a mouse and keyboard is a lot easier, but I- like something did definitely feel off about it. It just but. feels gross. It feels like you're emulating or something, mm-hmm. you know? You also played it on PS4 or with or a with PS2. A PS, what was it? PS3. No, but controller. just this year we played it yeah, on, on yeah, with a PS3 controller. controller. Yeah. Yeah. Did that feel weird or different? No, because I, I played that version before. Like that was the oh, first version okay. that I played okay. and then I played the GameCube version and that felt a lot better, but I'm comfortable with the PS2 version yeah. as well. The, I, I do hear people connecting the GameCube controller and Smash. Like, yeah, Joe. very specifically. Like, yeah, like, yeah, ridic- yeah. well, like, just to extremes, like, even in the competitive scene, like, people have been making Smash Boxes, which is basically, like, an all-button controller, and people have been playing with other means, like, just with arcade sticks, and, and people, like, tournament organizers have been, like, kind of iffy about whether they want to allow anything but the GameCube controller as part of tournaments, which is, like, a weird thing to, to really stick to, because it's, it's just... For, for a game to be that tied to the controller input seems so crazy. I, yeah. I feel gross every time I try to use any controller other than the GameCube controller, but at the same time, like, the weekend that Smash came out, I played so much in that weekend. Like, my finger was so sore because I think I used the shield and rolling more than the average Smash player, maybe. And so just having to push the GameCube controller so far in for the shoulder button, I love the GameCube. <laughs> I love that controller, but, like, does anyone else get sore? Does their finger get sore from using the shield so much? Uh, no, I was using a pro controller and I actually really oh. appreciated it because it had an analog, a secondary analog stick that's actually really good okay. versus the GameCube one, which I don't like. Well, you just uh, need it for Smash. Like it's not well. Big of a move. I I use the tilt. I use it for tilting attacks. So you can cause you, in Ultimate you can customize your controls and I use it to use like forward and A because those are harder to to do. So is like, this a, a smart thing that we should all do? Uh, I, I it depends on how much you use what kinds of attacks but like if you're trying sometimes I find it hard to like not do smash attacks when I'm doing forward and A yeah. so if I just do tilt forward it'll just do the tilt attack and I'm sorry for so much smash talk but it turns out everybody wrote in about smash but okay here's a dumb question because you're a fighting game fanatic so you know everything about this L- <laughs> sure. listen up here Mike <laughs> oh, yeah, Serial knows everything so uh, you know I play with my friends with smash but then we look online and we get really up in our heads about this tier list Mm-hmm. Like, oh, man, these characters are S tier. These are A tier. These are B tier. These are D tier. Uh, should we... Does that matter at all for us? Uh, it, or is that it, just it like the super does, high level? Does it... I think for one, it is sort of at a high level. Like if you're just playing with friends, like the differences can often be so minor that like for until you really should only start relying on tier lists when you get to a point where you are not, you don't feel like you are improving and you feel like the character is a detriment. So like until you get to a point where it's like, I'm not waiting, like I'm not, I don't feel like I am getting better then that's when you sort of start considering that stuff. And secondly, it especially doesn't matter now because the game is just out. Like most so people- So no one are, knows anything. Yeah. I mean, there are some early guesses. I, like people are saying the Belmonts are pretty good. Like yep. th- th- there's a lot of like, you know, somewhat true estimates, but in terms of like, just play what you want. Right now, play what you want. And th- then even if you start looking at tier lists of like, I want to get competitive, don't feel like you have to play like whatever's at the top. It's just play play the best thing that you're comfortable with, I think is a better path to doing well. Here, right. So like a, a dumb analogy might be like, let's say you're thinking, I might want to get into photography. Are you going to worry what about buying the like absolute best top of the line camera right away? Or are you just going to get comfortable with something that, like... Yes. Right. Learn the rule of threes first before you buy a DSLR. <laughs> yeah. It's very important. Yeah. Okay. That's that's a pretty good analogy. Um, Chris Reardon from New Bedford, Massachusetts. I think. That's a state. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I should what know do this you, What now. do you need help with? <laughs> Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Is it, you I pronounced it. Massachusetts <laughs> yep, I got correctly. It. I got nice it. Word. We're good. We're moving on. Uh, dear Ben and crew, I recently... This is just a cute little aside. But that's what the podcast is for, Mike. Yeah. He says, hey, dear Ben and crew, I recently got a second job. And first, I made a responsible move and increased my 401k contribution. But then I did something pretty irresponsible and bought a Switch and a few games and accessories. I don't have a question this week. I'm just excited. Uh, and my in real life friends don't care about games. We're happy for you, Chris. Oh, man. He, he sent a picture of his bundle. And it's like a Switch with a crazy fancy dock and a carrying case and like a pro controller and then just a copy of breath of the wild smash and mario odyssey it's like You're good. that's a good time that's worth that second job mm-hmm. man mm-hmm. you gotta treat yourself sometimes absolutely i love scrolling through just like my switch library and like man 
have some really good games on here. This yeah. is a really good system. Like Breath of the Wild. You should enjoy it more. <laughs> it's not important. Um, have you guys ever Manson thought five. about getting a second job? Every once in a while, just for S's and giggles, I just think, like, what if I just got a job on the weekend, like, working... Working at this McDonald's or something. Wouldn't it be interesting? Uh, the one I don't time have anything else going on. The one time I had two jobs, it was super difficult. Like, yeah. I, I w- it was basically, I worked at a, as a, like a fry cook at a place, and then I would also freelance at night. And there was like one time that I was working on a really long reported piece, and I'd basically go and work, like went to school, went to work, and then got home and started and did like, you know, four hours of research and then like for this reported article and it was just like i had i had no free time so i wouldn't do that again if, yeah. I, had, if I had the chance no I, I guess in college i had several jobs but it feels yeah. different now but not important uh beaten down brian from carlo ireland says hey gi crew between joker coming to smash and Geralt coming to monster Hunter world it's undoubtedly been a big week for video game crossovers that's true well i think crossovers are generally cool when they happen and if it's between two series I already enjoy, then that's great. However, I've been thinking, and personally, I don't feel like any one character, despite any level of love I might have for them, has ever been enough to draw me into a game that I previously had no interest in. Am I just a big emotionless weirdo for not caring about those cases? No. I mean, I... He, he's right. Like, that's all... It's about... a. It's about appealing to, like, the the overlapping sections of the Venn diagram, not not winning over new audiences. Right. Yeah, well, I don't know. There's something about, like, I never give a crap about Soul Calibur, and I barely care about Zelda, but the idea of, like, should I get Soul Calibur 2 on my GameCube just to play as Link? Because that seems kind of fun and funky. Oh, you know what it was? Is because I play Link in Smash. And so I saw that, and it's like, I wonder if I could get into Soul Calibur now as, like, some sort of Smash transfer through Link. It's the dumbest route no, of logic, like, but my, it kind of works. I didn't even know about Soul Calibur before Link was in it. Like, that's, really? That's literally how I got into that series was because, Link, I, oh, dude, Link's on that box. <laughs> and I bought Soul Calibur 2, and I played, the, like, the crap out of it, and it was awesome. That's so, awesome. Like, that's, that is a major example. Uh, Joe, we've talked about it before in the podcast, but I love that one of the producers for Soul Calibur 2 talked about how the PS2 version, that was supposed to be Cloud. And Square pulled it at the last second. Yeah. It's so frustrating. Yeah. Who'd they get instead? Haihachi, oh. the old go to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no questions asked there. And I wonder with Square pulling it, I mean, I'm sure it's a complete changeover of some staff there at Square, but it's funny too because Smash fans too have been complaining about like the limited amount that Final Fantasy is in Smash. Like there's two mm. songs, there's no spirits, Cloud's costume changes are like, you know, basically the light color of his shirt. Like, they don't allow you to have fun, but they still allow him to be in Smash. It's like the bare minimum Smash character. Yeah. I think in that case, it's because they have their own, like, crossover fighting series that... I mean, they have the Dissidia. Yeah. Right. So I think that their position might be, hey, if you want a bunch of crazy options and costumes that really pays homage to the Final Fantasy series, get Dissidia. Yeah. Yeah. Could Enjoy be. Cloud in his purple shirt in Smash if that's all you want. <laughs> Enjoy those two tracks. Yeah. Uh, P.S. has been down, Brian. I know he's been making some great videos about it, but it's a damn travesty that we haven't had a GI stream of Hitman 2 with Leo. Leo, I agree. I agree. I think we were both just pretty <laughs> busy when it came out. It's one of those things of like, gosh, we'd love to do that, but it's not front row seat in the in the attention car yeah one of the only very good one of the only videos i made about hitman 2 is just i made it on the weekend for fun for fun that was you killing sean bean yeah that's how busy we have been lately yeah i think it's because you know leo's working on the rage 2 cover story stuff and i'm working on other cover story stuff but it kills me that that's your game i'm dying yes <laughs> and now we're going to the holiday break and it hasn't happened have you been streaming it on your own no what the hell's happening with hitman 2 leo <laughs> I'm playing it privately and enjoying it. <laughs> All right. That's right. Session if that is, in this day and age, that is not okay, Leo. I'm sorry. Yeah. Mike, what would you like from Game Informer streams in the future, other than Leo playing Hitman 2? Oh. Hmm. I was just thinking about that earlier. Streaming something. I can't remember. We I, should stream something? Yeah, definitely. Okay. That's actually step oh. one. It's just <laughs> stream more often. Stream more yeah. often. Yeah. yeah. What was it? It was, um, I was thinking of, you could live stream, let's read a response. Oh, um, the um, game club. Oh, like us like, playing like, the game like, club on our own? Or like the responses. Or like the discussion. Like live stream the, the discussion points. Oh. As opposed to just do it, doing it as emails potentially. Right, oh, right, yeah. right. That could be fun. Yeah. Having live chat. Getting the chat. A bit more of a discussion than just reading the emails. That's a yeah. good point. Yeah, you're right. That May, is fun. And maybe not for everyone, but maybe for, you know, just like a certain one where it's not as viable to have it be as... Uh, 
segmented as uh, like per week or every other week, get your emails in by this time, just do it like a, we'll do it on this date, we'll do the the discussion. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that is a good idea. Like of all the segments of the podcast to stream, yeah, Game Club totally makes the most sense. I'm going to write this down. Yeah, this actually, piece I, of paper. the more I think about that, the more I like it. Yeah, wait a bit. Mike, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> we treat it like a book club for us because, like, we're here having the conversation. But yeah. to, like, really ro- like to really include the whole community in on it. Because for like, the first game club, we did do, like, a live chat for Final Fantasy VII. For, like, know. the first episode, uh, Miller did it and stuff, and then that just kind of trailed off. But that would be nice. You're totally right. Um, anyways, Dan... Wait, what? Hey, GI Crew. Oh, damn it. I didn't copy the name. Anyways, hey, GI Crew, my... Okay, here we go. <laughs> Holy God, I got this. Hey, GI Crew, my name is Dan, and I hail from North Dakota's largest city, which we all know. Okay. Super North Dakota. Yep. Fargo. There we go. My question pertains to the economics of game development. Honk shoo. And I'm a business, <laughs> I'm not a business owner, <laughs> but paying 30% of one's revenue to put a game on a digital storefront such as Steam seems soul crushing. If Epic's digital storefront fails, should a case be made that Steam is a monopoly and should be broken up by the government? This is interesting. Like, do you need more of a test case for that Steam is a monopoly than if Epic, who has more money than God at this point, cannot make it work in that in that model? I mean, Steam is a storefront. And right. there are so many other storefronts for you to sell your game. Like, it's not a monopoly. Yeah, good old games uh, sells games, new there, games all the time. There's, yeah, like, publishers or, have their own individual outlets. There's, like, stuff like Ichio. Yeah, there's, there's you know, uh, right. GOG. There, yeah, there's, so is there a monopoly if other stores are at, like, what, 10% of the user base, maybe? Like, it needs to be, like, completely crushing all competition like, 100% for it to be a monopoly? It's, like... Just because you're the like most popular storefront doesn't yeah. mean that you have a mono- like saying you're a monopoly means that, that you are there's a like an active discouragement or suffocation of like competition in that space. Yeah. And there's not. People want to go to Steam because Steam has the most people. Yeah. So keep the government off my valve. That said, I would love to see like a legitimate competitor to the Steam in that it would help them sort of like you know, get a fire under them to, to make better decisions about their storefront. Yeah. Yeah. We should point out Subnautica is free on the Epic store. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, PC, it's very cool. Uh, Chuck. So, oh, yes, sir. One of the nice things about Steam. Yes, sir. Is that it is the one-stop shop for that stuff. That's what I want right? to about. Because uh, like, like I have what, like an origin account and a Steam account. Uh-huh. I don't have an Epic account yet, but I will. So it's like, I don't like all of these different storefronts that I have to belong to. It's so much easier if, if my library can just be in one place. Mm-hmm. I like that. No doubt about it. So I don't necessarily want a whole field of different stories yeah, out there. For no it. competition for this kid. Okay. Uh, Chuck from, how would you pronounce this, Mike? Oh, Gross. Gross Isle, oh. Michigan. Says, Dear GI Podcast, I recently turned 39. Congratulations. As a gift to myself, I purchased Call of Duty Black Ops 4. To my horror... I am terrible. Uh, My reaction times are awful. I'm constantly distracted by background movements. That's weird. And despite playing on a 60-inch TV, I can barely read the fonts in the menus. 39. As a result, I've reverted to Rocket League, where the giant ball is easy to track. (laughs) My question is, have any of you aged out of first-person shooter games? Negative. Really? You're still good at them? Oh, yeah. Oh, I wouldn't say good at them. I play them. I wouldn't say I've aged out of them. Okay, you a Call of Duty guy? Eh, not really. What's your preferred first-person shooter? What's your yeah, favorite? Usually just, like, single-player, you know. Like, okay. Uh, like, a, whatchamacallit, um... Crisis 2. No. Mm. Haze. Bioshock. Yes, Bioshock. <laughs> Bioshock oh, okay. 2, multiplayer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, I don't know if I've aged out. I just think I've never been good at first-person shooters. Like, I missed the Call of Duty 4 train, and so now trying to get into Black Ops 4, which... Multiplayer wise, like the first Call of Duty I've really gotten into, which is crazy. Uh, and I love it a lot, but I'm just garbage, just getting trounced every round of Blackout. And I still love Blackout, but it is a miracle if I can kill somebody. I really feel like I've achieved something. Uh, I feel like I've, I've stopped sort of like 
investing in anything that isn't really Destiny at this point in terms of first person shooter like competitive stuff. So like in Destiny, I do okay, but I think a lot of it is learning sort of how your actual skill, uh, your sort of abilities interact with shooting, so that I minimize the amount of time I times I actually have to like score headshots consistently because there are other ways to to get kills and stuff. But in terms of like Call of Duty, Titanfall, things like that. I feel like I've I've sort of removed myself from like, oh, I need to be good to, to enjoy this. Yeah. Like I've sort of just shifted more towards like, I'll enjoy it and if it's fun, I'll keep playing. If not, I'll stop. Right. Leo, are you still good at all these games? Yeah, of course. Okay, great. <laughs> I yeah. thought I was tired of first-person shooters and then I got more into Rainbow Six Siege than any other game I've ever played. So. Oh, that's right. Really? More into it than any other game you've ever played? I think that's fair to say. Wow. I'm at right. 350 hours in game. Yeeshta. Uh, hey, GI Crew. Adam from Fox Lake here. And this was a question I've had some thoughts on. Is Microsoft going away from third-party exclusives next gen and basically deciding to make them all first party by simply buying the studio? That is interesting. So like this gen, Microsoft is trying to push a little more into third-party exclusives, getting out of the gate pretty early on with like Rise of the Tomb Raider for that certain window but do they even need so many third-party relationships now if their first party eventually will be pretty decent if all these studios can get up and running? Yeah, I think it's har- it's hard to sort of get those third-party exclusives when you're not leading in terms of sales because I think a lot of those, um, like you see a lot of PS4 exclusives that feel like, oh, why isn't this on Xbox? I think a lot of it's just development resources and if you're going to develop for one console, like I see a lot of PS4 and PC stuff, right? So, and a lot of it is isn't necessarily like Sony made a deal with these people. It's just, if we're going to make it for a console, we really only have the resources to do one. We may yeah. as well do PS4. Or there are instances where I've seen like, if it's a Japanese game, like a Japanese developed game, Xbox isn't doing so hot over there. So it's like, they're just not going to bother with that. Right. With that version. Like scale bound. Why bother making the Xbox yeah. one version? Who yeah. could ever want it? Uh, Who is going to win the next generation, Mike? If I mean to ask you. Um... I don't know. That's tough to say because Sony did so damn well this uh, generation. But, um, I mean, Microsoft's definitely spending the money on the studios. Um, it's hard to say because I, I still want to say, like, I don't, I don't want to say that Sony will, is, like, sitting on their laurels, stepping out of the out of the press conference of its next E3 and all that stuff. Yeah. I would still have a good amount of faith in their ability to pull out a credible lineup for next generation. Um, it all depends on Microsoft. Uh, I was... Um, Looking up uh, what they have, because uh, they purchased Ninja Theory, which was like yeah. one of the biggest ones that they purchased, um, and it, for me at any rate, that I uh, cared about. And um, they have them developing three VR games. Wait, Ninja Theory? Mm-hmm. Wait, Microsoft is making them develop? Well, them? I don't know if they're making them, but that's, that's what they have slated right now. Or, or um, Weird? I don't think so. I think Ninja Theory was working on some VR stuff like before Microsoft purchased them. Really? But that'd be weird if Microsoft was like, now you're making VR stuff, which Microsoft doesn't have a great avenue for. But mm-hmm. yeah, Ninja Theory was working on some weird VR stuff. Okay. They even released like Hellblade VR, right? Yeah. Yeah, that came out is, at some is point. That, is that out already? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think know. so. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, God, I hope they wouldn't make VR stuff in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I would, I, would, I would just hope they wouldn't, you know, push them towards, like, the connect death of, like, <laughs> that they did, like, last generation or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I would hope that they've smartened up at that point, but... I want to say, though, an interesting thing about this question, it reminds me, so, like, earlier this week, Ben and Suriel and I were playing a game of Avalon. That's right. A tabletop card uh-huh. game. And one of the key rules in that is that you can't let the previous round of the game yes. influence the current round yes. of the game. Yes, emotions right? have to be left at the door, yep. And I think it's a similar thing when you're dealing with console generations yep. and as we move from one to the other because like if you go back and look at moving from like the PS2 era forward, 100%. There was the same sort of sense of like, oh man, Sony is just doing so well with the PS2. The Xbox is fine, but it's like it's clearly lagging behind and then Sony just crapped the bed in that in the early days of the PS3 from that from that infamous press conference sort of in the what year or two after that. Yeah. Like there's a lot of hubris involved in there that seemed like I mean, the Xbox 360 was the winner, like beat the PS3 that generation. Absolutely. And I wonder how important that year head start is. I mean, if Microsoft gets out a year before, I can't imagine Microsoft would be coming out next year in theory if PS5 is coming out 2020. Since they just they released the Xbox One a year after the Pro, so it's it, their, their iterations would be even closer yeah. than usual. Yeah, interesting. But 
all, so all of that said, it's like, I think it's just impossible at this point to say who's going to win the next generation based on who based won. on right now. That's like saying who's yes. going to win the next game of Avalon based on the current game of Avalon. Report. Thank you for making the Avalon analogy. The only <laughs> analogy I can understand. Uh, hey, Game Informant says Joe from Lakeville, Minnesota. Uh, your recent discussion on quote of the year categories made me think of two more worth considering. Game Informer article of the year. My vote, the Polish gaming industry article by Matt Burtz in mm. uh, the Warcraft issue of the magazine. Also, well, let's start with that one. Game Informer article of the year. What do you guys think? Like, this is interesting because that is contained in the Warcraft 3 issue of the magazine. I don't really talk about it too much, but uh, it's so nice that I don't get to experience the magazine like you guys do where you have to proof it all the time and all that nonsense. Mm. I just get to go home on like a Sunday when the new issue comes out and relax and read through and be like, oh, this is what they're working on. Oh, I guess I heard somebody say something about this topic in the office. Yeah. Uh, And that Warcraft issue is a banger. That's like one of the best issues of the magazine I've ever seen in my life. It's so good. It's got the huge... Like, Burtz went to Poland and interviewed all like the top Polish developers about the history of developing in Poland. He got the big... Uh, breakdown of good old games, as Mike mentioned earlier, the Flash games, the Keeley interview, the Spider-Man afterwards, Warcraft 3, which is an interesting cover story, and afterwards on WarriorWare Gold. It, like, it has everything. Best issue of all time. Of all time, Mike. <laughs> it, it is a good one. It's a very yeah. good one. Uh, does an article stand out for you guys? Not to put you on the spot here, Mike. I can't think of anything right That's now. That's fine. <laughs> Man, like, it all sort of blends together for me in terms of, like, what was this year, necessarily? I know, like... One of, well, this is kind of kind of more silly, but it's not an article in the magazine, but, like, I really liked Leo's Who's Winning E3 video series. Yeah. That was really funny. Um, which was, like, funny, but also informative, and, yeah, Look I don't know. Look at that. Article like of the that. year, Leo. Way to go, man. <laughs> Thank you. I can just post those scripts online, and then they're articles. <laughs> <laughs> so anything stand out for you, Serial? Um, I think that Poland article is one of my favorite things I've read uh, from the magazine. Um... There was one that JV wrote that I don't remember that I Oh, remember. is it the... Um, the military the, one. Yeah, the military yeah. one this year. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was That was an interesting too. one for sure. Um, and then uh, Joe also says, best Game Informer podcast or video moment of the year. We don't need to go thoroughly in this one. But he says, he says his vote is the Game Informer history lessons on the 300th issue live podcast at Fulton Brewery. Uh, oh. That was probably that was cool. the yeah. highlight of podcasting. Specifically, it was fun just to get like some old timers in there on the mic and stuff. Um, but then the most fun part, and I think about this all the time, but like, man, I could have just done that all day. When we had that big group of drunkards in front of us drinking some Fulton booze, uh, and then we just had the top 300 list, and Leo had it up on like an Excel spreadsheet. And it's like, all right, everyone, shout out your favorite game, and we'll tell you where it landed. Like, that was so much fun. I don't know if you were in on that part, Joe. But I, it's was, like, I was there. Yeah, yep. Halo! And it's like, all right, great. Halo, where is it at? Number... 43 or whatever the hell it was like all right now let's talk about halo and you, you don't know what game you're gonna have to talk about next but just that rapid fire of like yeah i can talk about that game i can talk about that game that was so much fun yeah yeah that was that was really fun you should do that all day also drinking can be fun oh i don't know about <laughs> that cereal come on i really liked uh not it's not a podcast moment but the video moment apart from leo's was uh i love ben reeves man on the street things mm. so he did a what does the public know about Fortnite <laughs> video yeah that, those always just crack me up you were the one that watched that one ha 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 uh did, nobody really watched that one what, <laughs> really? i think it might be at like seven thousand views on youtube like i oh it was one of those like one. well certainly Fortnite's the biggest thing in the world peak Fortnite. this is gonna do bonkers and then everyone's just boo Fortnite sucks <laughs> all right <laughs> Yeah, I think we were making fun of it. I think well, I don't viewers know. and listeners, you should check that out. Even yes. if you don't care about Fortnite, it's a, it's, it's funny. Thank you. And the funniest thing, and Leo knows, he shot the Pokemon Go one when he was an intern, I believe. Uh, but shooting those sucks. It is uncomfortable. It's awkward. It's hot. You're mm-hmm. lugging equipment around for hours and hours and hours. Like shooting that is like what five hours or something for like the Fortnite one of mm-hmm. just wandering Jeez. the streets with Ben Reeves trying to tackle strangers as they're jogging by. <laughs> like, excuse me, excuse me, can you take your earbuds out? I have one question. It's just, it sucks to film, but it turns out fun, so it's always I, worth it. I like them. Um, let's see. Jake Z from Ventura, California says, hey guys, I just finished Red Dead Redemption 2 thinking it was easily the best storytelling I've ever experienced in video games. Then I started considering how it compares with the best television series such as The Sopranos, Breaking Bad, Mad Men. I know I have lower expectations for storytelling in games than TV series, but I can't help thinking that Red Dead Redemption 2 is up there with the best storytelling in any medium. What do you think about this? Man, I, I, I struggle with it a little bit since I haven't finished Red Dead, 
but like the more I play it, the more I'm just seeing sort of like a lot of their formula of like Arthur walks in, he's here's like a wacky character that you're supposed to think like, <laughs> look at this wacko, and then they're like, you need to help me, Arthur, with the, my with my wacky quest, and Arthur's like, I don't know about that, and oh, it's like, hell. please, you gotta help me. Ah, oh, shucks, I guess I'll help you out, do whatever. <laughs> like that has been like so many of the conversations in this game. Yeah. So it's 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 hard for me to like put it up against the te- uh, against like television which it has its own tropes like i'm not saying like it, it doesn't but like it's it's hard for me not i being do out of the think the towards the ending of red dead is where it really gets spectacular i think okay even if it does fall into a certain rhythm too of like i don't know about this one <laughs> <laughs> but we're going ahead like yeah. that is the rhythm it gets into towards, yeah. towards the end but it's still very good it's hard to dive too deep into without like getting into spoiler discussion i guess so but if, if you're it, interested in that you should listen to our spoiled discussion we do have the spoiled discussion but uh, I don't. I feel like there's a lot about Red Dead, in terms of the storytelling specifically, that is a very traditional, and that's not a bad thing, but a very traditional sort of Western tale, with familiar sort of Western archetypes and maybe zooming out, but zooming in, I feel like it's a combination of those performances. I feel like yeah, the writing so, and the delivery, like there's so many good little human touches in there that I think it does. It tops a lot of TV. It. It does a lot in different ways. I get, like, it's so weird. It's almost like apples and oranges in some cases because, like, there are certain kinds of things that a TV show can just convey better than a game or even a book. Right. You know, like, each medium is, like, uniquely suited to tell things a certain way. So there are things that the game that Red Dead does well that you can't get in a movie or a book in terms of player agency, in terms of making you feel connected, in terms of making you feel like you're forging a connection with like characters in the, the world. camp life. I mean, right. particularly yeah, that, like, that's the, 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 start like, of the show. There, there can be good moments that are caused by like the way, the way you're interacting with the game that don't feel like they parallel well with like film or cinema. Where exactly. You yeah. look at a lot of the cutscenes in Red Dead and they're like, they're well done. But like when I think back to some of my favorite moments in, in film and cinema, it's a lot of the way the choreo or like the cinematography conveys mm-hmm. the moment, which it's hard to sort of match that with Red Dead where a lot of your conversations are as you're on the way to an objective of like, we're having this conversation. There are some, some thematic, some themes emerging from these conversations that tie into the stuff in the cutscenes, but it's hard to sort of weigh sort of the strength of that storytelling when it is all like basically just the same just audio basically uh, hello in. cinematic camera that's but true eat you're right sometimes ass, Martin Scorsese. I will say, that's right. I'm, I'm also a little hesitant to, to elevate it too high on a pedestal because there's no point in like you know breaking bad where don draper and roger sterling are like what? driving in a car talking <laughs> and then the car just I blows agree. up <laughs> and it goes back five minutes and starts uh, the conversation again. god that's my favorite scene <laughs> from breaking bad <laughs> i'm just saying there's some Janky stuff in that game. Uh, but janky I think, stuff in your mind, too, wait, Joe, the going, way you just said going that. Going back to, like, the first Red Dead, I think my favorite moment has to do with the way, like, the mechanics bleed into the, like, the narrative moment, even if it, even if it's a minor thing. Like, there are, there are moments where it's like, okay, if this had been a movie, it wouldn't have been as impactful because I wasn't a part of it. And right. sort of, like, the way they conveyed that moment through interactivity right. is, the thing, is the thing that I loved about it versus, yeah. like, the acting was really good. Yeah. I, was, uh, I was thinking about, I think I looked it up on YouTube. It's like, I want to see certain cutscenes for Red Dead 2 over again. So you know how immediately when a game comes out, everybody makes Red Dead Redemption 2, the movie cut, you know what I mean, right. and put it up on YouTube? It's like... <laughs> 33 hours long you know it's just like <laughs> it is absurd trying to boil that game down to can you imagine like cutting that down to even a four hour movie and having it make sense it wouldn't capture a millisecond or and a also fraction everyone, of what it would everyone be. makes their Arthur look totally wrong yeah exactly yeah. there's only one Arthur it's the purple suit with the original <laughs> Arthur hat and a short beard that's Arthur hmm no I see it's clean shaven original hat blue coat with the little like brown leather patches on I don't shoulder. get it what do you call that character uh, Arthur. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was in that hotly debated interview with the Housers where they talked about writing Red Dead and the uh, 100-hour work weeks and all that stuff. I think it was in that where they said, like, yeah, the script in Red Dead Redemption 2 just for the main story is the equivalent of seven seasons of a TV show. And I think that is a good way of framing it. Like, that's how much content is packed into that MFing game. I mean, each chapter of that game could easily be, like, I mean... It's a season. It kind of has, yeah, the arc of a season yep. of a show. Yep. yep. It, it, math checks out. Uh, Derek from Whitewater, Wisconsin, is sick of all this positivity on the podcast. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, Mike, do you think we should be more cynical and mean? Um, 
Maybe for just like a little bit. A little bit. Maybe like a cynical minute or something. Okay, great. Welcome to Game Informer Cynical Minute. Uh, so That's Derek, a dumb idea. <laughs> it says, hey, GI crew, with all the talk about God of War and Red Dead for being game of the year, I was wondering, what game was your least favorite that came out this year? Quiet, man. <laughs> oh. We've never really talked about it on the show. J- it Jamie, doesn't deserve any yeah. attention. <laughs> You've it already mentioned so it bad. more than it should be. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so how long was it to play through, though? It depends. <laughs> so it's okay. like one playthrough of The Quiet Man is about three hours. But after one playthrough of The Quiet Man, you unlock dialogue. <laughs> so that means that <laughs> you, then for your second playthrough, you actually understand what was being said. You understand what the story is. The story is just, for your first playthrough, completely opaque. Ooh, ambiguous just, storytelling, like a Team Eco no, game. but there's not even storytelling. Oh. It's, it, it's like... Ugh, God, there's so much to complain about here. What what did you give that game? A three, I okay. think. Wow. It's the second lowest score I've ever given anything at Game Informer. As a fan of Square, do you think there's any comparisons to be made for the bouncer? Did it remind you of the bouncer every once in a while? No. Okay. No. As a fan of the bouncer, should I check out the Quiet Man? <laughs> yes, you would love it. Oh, I'm listening. No, no, you shouldn't. I okay. mean, the, the bouncer is largely like a brawler. Yeah. This game has is a terrible movie with brawling elements. Oh. Uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, so like part of the reason it, it, it's kind of a tricky topic because it has a deaf protagonist and there are right. some interesting things you could do there, I think. And so I feel bad crapping on it because it's like, well, ah. no, I, I guess I feel like I want to clarify because like, because it would be interesting for a game to it would be interesting for a game to artfully explore how someone who cannot hear would experience the world around them, right? That could be a cool concept. And so I don't want it to sound like I'm not liking this game because I can't hear it and therefore like, and, and that I haven't considered that that's an angle that maybe they could be going for. Yeah. But that isn't actually the angle they're going for. Oh, because it's made cl- it's clear in certain situations, either through sign language or lip reading or something, that the main character is understanding information that is being given to him. He is communicating, and you as a player are cut off from that information. You don't understand. Oh, because of lip reading. That's so weird. So it's so. For instance, let's say that someone is talking to you, yeah. and your character can l- read their lips and understand what's being said. Uh-huh. There, there aren't subtitles for you. That sucks. So it's not like you can... It's, you are not getting information at the same rate that he is. Yeah. It's just for your first playthrough, you don't understand anything anyone's saying. Joe, I have bad news. What? You've been talking about the quiet man on the podcast. <laughs> I know. It just gets, it just I understand. gets me I understand. so mad. So then for your second playthrough... <laughs> we get it, Joe. The game sucks. It we gives it. you the text, but then you realize that the story that you were wondering about the first time was just terrible. <laughs> and you were better off not knowing yes. rather than seeing the ridiculous plot unfold. So got it. Got it. The Quiet Man is awful. Do not play it. There's think not that? even in a like, so bad it's good, funny kind of way. Don't play it. Sorry. Do you think there's room for improvement? Like if they did like a sequel, do you think oh. there's a- anything that they could like potentially improve on to make it more worthwhile. God, don't do a sequel. I mean, like, do a spiritual successor. Like, mm. take, take the ideas that w- could have been in there and get some decent performances, some good game design. <laughs> just, like, just, a new game. just go watch A Quiet Place. Like, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, 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 you're set. You're set. Yeah. I was thinking about the games where it's like Culling 2. That was pretty bad. But then again, I don't even know if I got into a match. I think I was just stuck in the lobby. So that's a bad game. But that was, barely counts. Was Agony this year? I don't know. Might oh, Metal Gear Survive. Yeah. yeah. Was, but then again, you gave it like a six. So, well, that's... Yeah, well, yeah Serial. Oh, Serial did. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, that, that was a pain. Like, it was funny because like that... It's not like The Quiet Man where I have nothing but seething hate for it. It's just... <laughs> I'm, I'm just bummed because... You, you're still playing a version of Metal Gear Solid 5 in here, and that's still, like, it, it shines bright enough that it makes me more disappointed in everything around it. Yeah, and, like, the early discussions we had on the podcast, I remember when I was talking about it, it's like, God, I think I kind of want to like this game. Yeah, like, when that's I, the tough when I, impulse with when that. I, when we were playing it for previews, it kind of felt like pe- when people came out of it, it's like, you know what? 
maybe it's a, this is terrible. And, yeah, yeah. Because, like, yeah. obviously the narrative was that this game is complete garbage because Kojima is not involved and it's yeah. just Konami explaining the franchise. But, like, when you played it, it's like, this is Metal Gear Solid Five, and Metal Gear Solid Five is pretty good. So, like, yeah, just seeing that game just fall apart as I played more and more of it was super disappointing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's not the worst in the sense that it's, like, bad, but it's the worst in that it's just seeing how, fall, how far Metal Gear has fallen. Absolutely. Yeah. I was thinking about the game that I was the most pissed at not being good, and it was the one that I spent 20 bucks on uh, so that we could record a video and then uh, Leo might remember this one. We tested it out because it was a PlayLink game. The one where you use your phone on the PS4. Oh, Hidden Agenda? No, no, no. Although, I don't think that. I think that would have been last year. No. This one was called Frantics. It was from Knock, the team that made, like, Bumpy's Party, Spin the Bottle, and that Affordable Space Adventures? Okay. Is that what the game was called? Affordable Space Adventures in particular. It was really good. And this was, like, their take on a Mario Party type thing for PlayLink, and it was just bad. Leo, you remember that, Jim? I do. That was this year, man. I don't remember exactly why I hated it so much <laughs> that I decided against us doing a video about you it. You said, by God, you will not record a video <laughs> in my studio. Feet. Mike, yes. what was the worst game you played this year? Hmm. Even if you only played best games, what was yeah, the worst Yeah, I was going to say, like, I have such like a, a backlog that I only played three games that actually released this year. Everything what? else was for like from the year prior. So like, oh. I, I played like 25 games this year. Only three actually released this year. Interesting. And it was God of War, Spider-Man, Red Dead, and... Uh, Donut County and like I enjoyed all those. So, <laughs> so Donut Good. County I, was the worst game you played <laughs> this year. Garbage <laughs> County. I liked all of them. Yeah. Good way to play, man. <laughs> Just only choose the good ones. Why don't we think of that? <laughs> <laughs> That's so much smarter. Uh, let's see. Eddie says, hello, Benny and the GI crew. Hello. Uh, with the Game Awards having come and gone, great commentary, by the way. We did it, Leo. Yay. Uh, and Xenoblade Chronicles 2 being snubbed in the RPG category. Do you think Super Smash Bros. Ultimate will suffer the same fate, fate since they both released in December? I wouldn't say Xenoblade was snubbed in the. Don't you think it deserved a nomination in Best RPG of the Year for the Game Awards? Because that's that weird window, you know. Yeah, actually, probably it should have. Yeah. Um, and wow, and Xenoblade Chronicles Two actually got like so much better this year than it was when it first released. And he like, brings up that point of like, do you think the steady drip of DLC for characters for Smash will keep it in people's minds and it'll be a contender for Game of the Year? Next year at the Game Awards, I don't think so. I think people are going to forget that it falls in that December window and it's out the window, at least for them. Yeah. And for like, us, it's in consideration. I don't but. know for sure how all the nominations are handled, but I th think like the like the press has some sort of say in, in what gets I don't nominated. know how the nom Yeah, we vote on the nominations, but I don't know how they get to that point. I have yeah. no idea. It's confusing. But right. uh, I think the Game Awards, yes, screws over December releases a little bit. I hope to God that it's on Game of the Year nomination at least for next year yeah. but and there's like, gonna be so many good games next year Ugh. it's also kind of a harsh reality though is is for games like smash brothers for games like below yep for things like things coming out in december like it's it's just that's one of the things you're gonna have to deal with as a developer or publisher when you really when you have to or decide to release your game in that time frame it's just it's 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 not something because like they're not gonna hold the game awards in January because at that point like it's kind of like a little more passe. It's like more exciting. That's to have time them. to read the game informer issue about the game. That's right. Year. Yeah. But like for something like a televised event, it's it's harder. It's better to do it in December because it's totally. more exciting for people. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah it's tough. Uh, but yes, yeah, Smash Game of the Year. Um, anyways, <laughs> uh, oh boy, Mike, Massachusetts. Thank you. Guy. Um, oui? I say guy. Uh, I'd say guy or guy. Okay, guy or guy. <laughs> Guy LaDouche here from Brazil, uh, the south of it. Hello. He says, so the next Marvel Ultimate Alliance will be exclusive to the Switch. So let me pitch you on this. Hulk in Smash? Captain America in Smash? Anyone? Anyone? In Sm it's, mm. People are in Smash. Anyone? In Smash. I think the idea of Marvel licensing playing nice with Nintendo licensing... That sounds like a meeting with 16 lawyers in it and nothing's coming out the that other side. That sounds like there's only going to be one track on the soundtrack for me. Yeah, <laughs> it really is. Yeah, that, that would be awesome. And it makes sense on paper, but I think those companies, boy, that'd be a tough mix. Also, as someone who does not play Smash Brothers, <laughs> yes. I am glad that the people who do are enjoying it and love the speculating. I love the enthusiasm around uh, it. We left the cynic minute a while ago. Um, there is no... For me personally... There, I can't think of a more boring conversation than blank in Smash. You're a real what about, asshole, Joe. <laughs> what, about, what about Joker in Smash from Persona 5? No. Not, not interested? Mm -hmm. Joe, 
What are you doing? That is no, the, no, you no. Know how many people are asking about that? Mike was just about to agree with me. No, I was actually say I was thinking about this morning. Uh, what about Vault Boy? No, would, would it wouldn't tickle, uh, tickle your fancy. Uh, what I think is Fallout Shelter on Switch. So technically, no. they, they gets around the loophole. Oh, P.S. says uh, Guy from Brazil here. Smash gameplay is always bad. Change my mind. Um, I can't. But you are clearly wrong. <laughs> I don't understand hatred towards Smash gameplay, but I've been playing it so much for the last twenty years that I, I can't imagine touching that game and just not feeling like it's a nice warm blanket, like it's a cup of hot cocoa from Mama. That's Smash <laughs> gameplay. Like, I'm so oh. bad about that, man. Okay, Mama's cocoa. <laughs> hey, is Mama's cocoa gonna be in Smash? You yeah. tell me. Uh, Kelly writes in, says, "Hey, just wondering." My wife is making me get rid of my years of Game Informer magazines. Would there be any reason Game Informer or someone else would want them instead of me just taking them to the recycling center? Uh, no, I don't think so. Unless you have like some really old ones that we might be missing. So if you have stuff from like, you know, the 90s, before the 2000s yeah. or something. Let us know which issues you have <laughs> yes. and we'll tell you if there are any we want. <laughs> Thank you. That's how this is. <laughs> They're like works. trading cards. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, here we go. So... A while ago, we were talking about 2017 versus 2018 in video game releases, and it was tough. Because so remember the top of the heap for 2017, but a lot got lost in the way, and people were outraged, saying, like, you idiots didn't do 2017 justice. Uh, so Tristan from Perth, Australia, wrote in with a big list of 2017's great games, oh, just to remind good. us. Yeah. Um, so here we go, just this Tristan's list here, saying Zelda Breath of the Wild, Mario Odyssey, Persona 5, Divinity Original Sin 2, Nier Automata, Neo, Horizon Zero Dawn, Wolfenstein 2, PUBG, Cuphead, Pyre, Hollow Knight, Night in the Woods, Yakuza 0, Uncharted Lost Legacy, Destiny 2, Mario Rabbids, Splatoon 2, Xenoblade Chronicles 2, Hellblade, South Park, Fracture But Whole, Tekken 7, Shadow of War, Assassin's Creed Origins, East 8, Lacrimosia of Dana. We don't need to cut that one. Mm-hmm. Injustice 2, What Remains of Edith Finch, Metroid Samus Returns, Sonic Mania, Resident Evil 7. And that's in a year where Mass Effect bombed. So, of course, <laughs> things are very subjective, but clearly 2017 is better. I think it's a tough call when you run down that list, man. No, I mean, yeah. there's a lot I don't care on on, on that list as well, though. Of yeah, course. <laughs> yeah. It misses but, for me, but I, I feel like overall, I liked more. I think 2018. For me, it had a higher average overall. Yes. But I would say that, like, looking back on it, I'm making my top 10 of the year right now. And I think my top two from last year, Wolfenstein and Zelda, would probably still be top two if they came out today. In, Hang on. In walk me through that again. Mm-hmm. It, okay. So, overall, I yeah. like 2018 better. I know. Just, high, just the what beats what thing. Uh, so, I think Wolfenstein and Zelda, for me, would beat everything that came out this year. For me, personally. Whoa. That's interesting. I was thinking about it a lot, too. Thinking about Zelda and PUBG which were my number one and two last year. God, I think Zelda tops Red Dead and God of War for me, and PUBG would probably probably be below that. So it's a weird split. Okay. Yeah, uh, but I, I oh. would, it, but that's like the only thing of 2017, right? That would trump I anything I think my top 10 list, the average is going to be higher for my love for, in 2018. For sure. But Zelda is so good, and it's, there's so many other great games. Especially there. for me, like there was, it felt like there were more titles that spoke to me, like that felt like, oh, this is some, this is my thing. Like, you know, we got like a new Undertale sort of this year. We had a new Soul Calibur. Yeah. Like, uh, we have an amazing Dragon Ball fighting game. That's true. Like, there's stuff that feels like it is more catered to me, whereas I felt like I could acknowledge and respect a lot of the, the best of 2017, but it felt like, eh, I'm okay. Like, yeah. there's a lot of stuff that didn't personally appeal to me in that way. On the Game Informer review scale, uh, this is interesting. He So, oh, I'm sorry. This is somebody else. This is uh, Brian Brown from St. Louis, Missouri. He breaks it all down, which is really helpful. But just... 2017 was stronger for like the tippy top reviews, right? Because Breath of the Wild got a 10, obviously Red Dead 2 got a 10, God of War got a 9.75, and then the next highest score for 2018 was Black Ops 4, which is a 9.5, also Smash 9.5, Spider Man 9.5, Monster Hunter World 9.5. But 2017 is Breath of the Wild with a 10, Wolfenstein 2 got a 9.75, Mario Odyssey 9.75, Divinity Original Sin 2 9.75, and Metroid Samus Return also 9.75. See, like, it was killer. When you look at it as an organ, like Game Informer as an organization, yes, I like for me personally, none of those are nine seven fives. <laughs> oh really? Like, okay. Uh, as a reviews editor, they're throwing a lot of reviews under the bus. Here. No, not <laughs> under the well, bus. Like, I know, like, I know, like I know. reviews are someone's opinion, right? You know, right, like right. I read all of those and felt like they justified their score. But when yes. I, when I played those games, like, like God of War, Red Dead Redemption. And like my number one from 2017 was Persona 5. And I'd say that, man, 
Yeah, Persona 5 isn't beating either of those two games for me this year. Oh, okay. And I love Persona 5. It would probably come in... Persona 5... You gave it a 925, right? Yeah. I think it would probably come in... Uh, like above like Spider-Man for me this year. Wow. Okay. So 2018 just crushes it. So yeah, I mean, f- for me, 2018, my like top 10 of 2018 list is way generally way, I'm way more enthusiastic about it. Yeah. I hear you. Uh, Mike, definitively, which year is better? Need an answer here. Yeah. I'd have to go 2018. Yeah. All right, there it is. Easily. There you have it. Well, I mean, if you're going by the ratio of the games you played, then yes, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, 2018 exactly. kills it. Joe was right. Absolutely. <laughs> but, I mean, they're still both great years, so it's like it's it's still a good situation. We don't allow that kind of banal chat All on right. the podcast. <laughs> Every game's great. <laughs> what uh, if 2017 was in Smash? <laughs> Shut up, Joe. <laughs> uh, they should put 2018 <laughs> instead. <laughs> what? Uh, what do you Echo guys like fighter. for email of the week? Echo fighter. <laughs> Uh, I liked the uh, God of War uh, Game of the Year edition. That was a surprisingly hearty talker. I liked the least favorite game of the year. I like Microsoft third-party exclusives. I like Red Dead Storytelling. Mike, I, I'll gotta let you call I, it, man. I feel like the... Well, my vote would be oh. for the Red Dead Storytelling. Yeah, I, I feel was, like I that, that gave us the best conversation, that one well. I think. Yeah? It definitely drove out the most uh, amount of interesting conversation and... Uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting and divisive amongst There you control. go. What if I told you? And don't, let, don't let this influence your vote. It's Jake Z. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it seems fine. Jake Z <laughs> from Ventura, California. There we go. Congratulations. God's Country, email of the week. Here's the thing. Next week is the last podcast of 2018. Mm. So you know what that means. No. Email of the year. Ooh. We need to determine the one and true email of the year. Does it get a special pin? It will get the special pin, and then we'll wipe the board. We'll wipe the board completely outside of that. It's going to be intense. I think we'll have to have like a bracket system and run through this stuff. Mm. We'll figure it out next week. It'll be a fun time. <laughs> All right. Mike, thank you so much. Anything else you want to say? Anything you want to say about the show that could make it better? Could you improve anything else uh, from Game Informer? No, I think you guys are doing pretty awesome. No, you don't need to say that. Mm. No one you want to give a shout-out to? Yeah. No, not really. Just the fans, Overblood Group. You guys are amazing. Yeah. Oh, what do you like the most about the Overblood Group on Facebook? Um, the interesting di- diversity of people in that group. I mean, there's some really wonderful, heartfelt uh, individuals. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a good group. A lot, good a lot of creativity there, and I think that's what I, I really... It's it's very polite, for the most part. Nice cr- creativity <laughs> in that group. Yes. You know? I'm completely with you. It's also just... It's fun to use just as a forum. Like, it's, it's my favorite mm-hmm. gaming forum is going over to the Facebook group, which... How do people get into it? It's not public. Is it public at this point? Word, word of mouth. No, it's not public because you still have to like uh, ask for, um, you have to submit your request to get into the group and then answer some questions like, you know. Are you an a- Yeah, exactly. Okay. But um, yes. it's not public. <laughs> Got it. Well, hey, Mike, thank you so much again for watching Extra Life, donating to Extra Life. You're unbelievably generous and uh, everybody appreciates. Champion of the people. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Thank, thank you, guys. Way to go, Mike. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah, Good absolutely. Chat. Thank, yeah, thank you, guys. And thank you for watching and listening to this segment, but the show goes on because now we also give applause to our interns. It's their last week at Game Informer. We're saying goodbye to them, so stay tuned for an informative chat fueled by community questions pulled from the Facebook group coming up next. And welcome back to the Informer Show. I'm still here. We're joined by our wonderful batch of outgoing interns. We have Jill Grote. You say hi. You say oh, hi to the hi. mic. Oh, hi, yeah. Hi, I, listeners I have to hear hi. your voice. And JP slash John Paul Gamboris. That is correct. Hello, everybody. This is the first time you really are forced to say these interns' last names. So <laughs> I know these people well. I just swear I've never had to say mm. Gamboris out loud. It's a tough one. It's very complicated. Mm. Yes. Okay, you guys, when did you start? Uh, September, mid-September? September 9th. Okay, let's see. So really? On the dot. Wow, good Look memory. At this guy. So let's see. It was like... Oh, actually, for, go ahead. Oh, no. I, I think like Extra Life was definitely peak exhaustion or peak moment in my mind with you guys. Like the, yeah. whoever intern batch is there for Extra Life, it's a blessing and it's a curse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I went that full 25 and I was super proud of myself I'm very and impressed. Mm. you know it didn't the sleep depression uh deprivation didn't hit me until like a week later 
What? And really? I was just like doing the dumbest things. <laughs> like, actually, that wasn't just a random spot in your life. It's possible. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's not that tough to go 25 hours when there's like excitement in the room. Uh-huh. You got adrenaline pumping more than you realize. Pies throwing. Yeah. Mustard pies. Yeah, nothing more fun than that. Yeah. Uh, was that stressful or are you happy that your term happened to coincide with Extra Life? No, I was really happy. Okay. Uh, yeah. Especially since it kind of hit my wheelhouse since I'm an unusual intern in the fact that I had a career before this. Oh. And I came from like donor relations and museums. So that was the thing I did. Yeah, it helped out a lot because people don't see like the, uh, the back half, the, the yeah. rest of the iceberg with Extra Life, right. which is like... Game Informer's hallways are lined with posters to sign and all these packages. It's like, okay, we now have to box up, God, was it 70-something auction yeah, items? Yeah, it was I'm around 80 with all the posters and everything, too. And just slowly shipping that out, getting the right address. There's so many little things where somebody's like, actually, I'm in Canada, psych. Yeah. Or like, actually, you shipped it out to the wrong address because I just moved and I accidentally gave you my old address. Like, those types of little things just add up and end up in weeks and weeks of just shipping and labeling. And Jill helped out a lot with that. Yeah, JP did we do a well. good job? Did we uh, Did we nail it? We mostly got everything. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All right. Please let us know if we didn't. But by God, mm. hopefully everything's going we, out. We definitely now. tried. It's weird. This is a whole Extra Life themed episode because the the email segment segment as oh, well. Yeah, true. Um, also, in addition to GlitchCon, or in addition to Extra Life, I was going to mention the GlitchCon thing. GlitchCon was really dope. I had a great time at that, seeing a bunch of indie games. Are those just from like the Minneapolis scene? Yeah, for the most part. So That's... this was like a launch party. We've mentioned GlitchCon in the past, I know, and it's still going on in uh, the Twin Cities area. And this was a launch party at our PBS affiliates here in St. Paul and yeah. stuff. And I love that both you guys. You, I brought it up, and you're like, hey, we're there. And also, the best part, you immediately like branched out, weren't following each other around, weren't following <laughs> me around. It's like, oh, what? Indie developers? Let's go talk to some folks. Yeah. It was amazing. Um, I sat down at one of the tables and started playing, and I just turned out to be amazing at it. Mm, uh-huh. And I was playing with the developer next to me, which I didn't know at the time. Was this Ella Metals? Yeah, it okay. was Ella Metals. It was real fun, if anyone wants to check Shout that out. Shout out Ella Metals. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I was just killing. Uh huh. And then I became best friends. Like, yeah. L- literal best friends. Forever. Literal best friends. You guys bought the locket and sealed at it at hip. that point. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> yeah, that was nice. I'm happy you guys went. Did you have a good time there, JP? Absolutely, man. I mean, they had uh, they had the bar, so I had my uh, gin and tonics. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. no. Nice. Honestly, <laughs> some great games there. Honestly, um, elemental elementals. Is that it? Yeah, yeah. That yeah. was really cool. There was one where you had to like work together with people oh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, do, are you familiar with what it was like color coded the jogging one yes oh my god it's out on steam now it's I'm got wishing. a really clever punny name i know that i love the name yeah leo can you google jogging local co-op multiplayer game on steam we'll get to the bottom of this uh, hyper dot i remember that was another one that was really cool yeah it should be coming out soon i'm um, very excited yeah about yeah that no I, I had no idea that i mean like it's just so localized, like the indie scene. The developers are just like in Minneapolis. There's that many. And yeah. Just so many cool games. It was really neat. They're everywhere. Point. These yeah. developers, they're spreading the like indie wildfire. Scene, man. It's crazy. <laughs> Indies are the future. I've said it for years. <laughs> okay. um, Jill, I have a weird history with you. Where is at E3 this yes. year, right? Yeah. You were one of the few people that like shouts out like, oh, I listen to the podcast. And you're like in line for like <laughs> no, MFing Skull and Bones or something. I wasn't just in line. <laughs> I was like, I had been in line for two hours and it was like literally 30 seconds until my turn oh to go. really and i saw ben hansen and i was like i cannot miss the opportunity so sad. to run over <laughs> so i absolutely did i was i had nothing important you could have to stood say. in line and then yelled out to me and i would have gone over there it's not like i was yeah. refusing to enter the skull and bones area i don't know maybe you just like hear someone yelling your name and run the other direction right i right, had right. to like she's told me this story like three times oh it's so good and it changes every so time good. it gets more and more intense right the numbers inflate leo what do we got Joggernauts? Joggernauts. Yes. Thank That's the one. you. How do we not remember that? Mm. Uh, did you have a good time at E3 then? Oh, absolutely. What was it like just being a member of the public? Just being a normal human being? Yeah, what's <laughs> it like being mortal? Uh, <laughs> so, it's the second year I've gone because they're letting normal people in. Uh-huh. The first year, it seemed like they sort of didn't know how to deal with us, which was good and bad because you got kind of treated the same as everybody the first year. I think the second year they're starting to firm up like how to deal with non like industry people. Right. But it's sort of a little more limiting. Mm -hmm. Like I saw a lot more, um, Oh, industry people go, go first and people lose their spot and that sort of thing. Uh, (laughs) but I had an amazing moment. 
uh, where Miyamoto came through. No way. And I was like uh, completely oblivious looking around, you know, enjoying my life. And then these like big burly guys start walking in. I'm like, what's going on? There's something. So I've, I'm like looking around, being oblivious, and I almost get trampled by these burly guys. I'm like, what's going on? And I look, and he's just in there smiling. And That's I the thing. Like, the how much does a ticket cost to, to E3? That's a good question. Um, is it like 200 something like yeah, that? Yeah, it's in that range. Okay. Think, uh, do you think the price is going to drop now that Sony is not involved? Yeah, exactly. The anti-Sony discount. Yeah. I have no idea. We'll but see. thinking about it, like, you know, it's easy to poo-poo on the public experience to E3. It's a, it's a lot of lines. Yeah, the show isn't quite fully evolved to this point yet. Same time, 200 bucks to see Miyamoto in person. Like, yeah, that's that was worth great. it in my mind. Forgive me. Remind me who Miyamoto is. How dare oh. I know? Oh, I know. I didn't want to say uh, What it. about like uh, God Howard or whoever you worship <laughs> over there? Like, a free God Howard, yeah, dude. Uh, I saw him too. Oh, make it 500 bucks at that point. Uh. JP, who's your favorite developer? Uh, favorite developer? God, I mean, I would say Bethesda, but it's definitely Rockstar now. Okay. Yeah. All right. So if you saw Dan Hauser in the crowd, no one knows what he looks like. But if you saw him out there, that'd sure, be the, the big buzz. Sure, the British burly guy. Yeah, for sure, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you into Red Dead Online at all? Uh, well, you know, Uh-oh. as I told you, I haven't played it yet. That's insane. I uh, unfortunately no I don't have a console here out in Minneapolis, so I haven't really played it. I can't wait to get back home and play it though. What games are you guys playing when you're out here then? Um, like I'm trying to keep up with things, yeah. like. It's an amazing like situation because you're in this area where people are super passionate and you hear about things that maybe you wouldn't otherwise and play games you wouldn't otherwise. But it is sort of like, I've just started this and now there's something else new and I need to check that right, out. Right, and right. so um, I think last night I jumped into... Uh, Thronebreaker, the Witcher mm. card game yeah. situation. That feels <laughs> remarkably under the radar this year. Yeah. You played it, Hanson? No, I'm not into that no, card. I'm not into it. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool that like it seems more ambitious than people realize just yeah, on the storytelling no, front. And as Serial mentioned, you can even like skip the the Gwent parts, which is interesting. Huh. Yeah, there's a like in the beginning when you're choosing your um, difficulty level, they they have that section, and I was like. Pfft. I'm going for it. So going for it meaning I'm I'm gonna play all the Gwent. All right. So is it like an adventure game, and then there's like Gwent elements to it? Yeah. Uh, when when you would battle somebody, uh-huh. it turns into a card game situation. Gotcha. Or there were puzzles, uh, like branching storyline type stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of different you know choose choose your own adventure uh, scenarios. Fair. Perfect. Uh, we have a bunch of questions from the community. People, especially the Facebook group, the the Overblood Facebook group, they really came out swinging for you nice, guys. Nice. Okay. So this is going to be. Guys. I don't know. We can make it rapid fire or not. It can or be not. a little more relaxed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. First question. Ramses Garcia is asking, "What were your favorite games growing up? Also, is the N64 an ancient console to you guys? N64 okay. is my console. Is my console of nostalgia. That's your baby. Yeah. So when that that mini console comes out." Is the one I'm going to jump on. Okay. Yeah. All right. The N64 is what I first played. Like, I remember the first video game I ever played was actually Super Smash Bros. At a friend's house. That's amazing. Um, yeah. And then Pokemon Stadium. Pokemon Snapshot. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, those are some real gems. Just straight snap. up snap. Um, the stadium, I mean, they just, um, God, I forget what his name is, but he works for the MPDs. And he released, like, the overall console sales for so many generations. And it was crazy because Pokemon Stadium was, like, sixth or fifth highest selling on n64 I believe it, yeah that game is not good it's, you know <laughs> Pokemon fan. Yeah. it's like once you see those models in 3d it's like pack it up because you're not gonna have that much fun with the lick a tongue mm-hmm. licking Getting the plate sushi. game Love yeah it. it's very smart oh it's fantastic okay so favorite games then pokemon stadium's number one for both of you or oh no okay uh i might get some you know push back from this but oh. majora's mask is amazing Number one and Zelda. I still, it is has a very special place in my heart. What about it? Um, I think it's the first time in a gaming situation. I was very young, and I realized that games could be different and have like bad. No, oh, just messing with you. No, Majora's Mask is very cool. I will come at you. <laughs> I'll defend it to my death. Um, just that it had different parameters. It wasn't just you know point A to point B. It was kind of creepy and kind of weird and it yeah just was it's probably it's probably experience. like the best case of a developer remixing a game because what they had like a year to crank that out and they couldn't do anything too new mm-hmm. in terms of just like remixing things 
bringing time into the remix and the way right. the developers are remixing that stuff, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Did you play the 3DS version as well? I did. Okay. I didn't mean to play it at some point. Because the only, the only time I played Majora's Mask was on that god-awful GameCube port. Remember? <laughs> mm. Where it was like the oh, Zelda yeah. bundle yeah, yeah, where yeah. it had all the Zelda games. It was like running at nine frames per second. It was <laughs> insane that they actually released that. It's yeah. gross. Uh, okay, JP, number one game. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I tend to do it by console generation. I loved San Andreas for the PS2. Like, speaking of Rockstar and Bethesda, I love San Andreas, and then I really love Fallout 3 for 360. Also really like Grand Theft Auto 4. And Four. New Vegas has been kind of edging out three for me as of late wait going back and playing it or just thinking about yeah it? man i played it like four times in a row like different you know like what? deep playthroughs and um I be- that was like the game i was playing before i came out here was new vegas um so you must be like just primed for outer worlds then That's yeah the absolutely RPG. dude absolutely does I mean, it worry you that it's not exactly fully the new vegas team or is it like ah, oh, it's close enough i'm sure some devs have worked on it so why not i mean i go off the looks of it and right. i would just say I, I like the 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 dialogue system so far. Um, yeah. Just like, it, it looks good to me. All right, tell me on a scale of one to ten how dumb this was. One time, it was on the South Park Stick of Truth mm. cover story trip. We're hanging out with Obsidian and talking Fallout, and I'm not much of a Fallout guy okay. at all. <laughs> and so I, because I really felt like philosophizing a little bit or whatever, nice. I said to this group of Fallout New Vegas developers, I said, wouldn't it be cool in Fallout if there was just like some place that like wasn't affected by the bombs that was still like relatively unaffected? And they're like, did you play Fallout New Vegas? <laughs> uh, no, no, I did not. Is that the entire premise is that New Vegas wasn't hit and wasn't wiped out and so everything's still kind of intact? Yeah, I mean, I guess. Okay. I mean, it's still in a radiated desert filled with mutant geckos. So that wasn't 10 out of 10 gaff. That was like no. 6 out of 10? No, I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, dude. All right, good. I can live <laughs> with that. Okay, Matt Pilkington continues the community questions here, broadening out a little bit. He says, what genres do you tend to stay away from and which are your favorites? Okay, most the, the genre you're most scared of. Um, I don't wade into shooters terribly wow. often. Wow, okay. Yeah. What does it take to get you over that line? Red Dead. Oh, you count that as a shooter. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Well, All right. I mean, it's... Uh, it's just shooting. What do you think of it? It's just boring? Or? No, I mean, kind of. The mechanic itself is not something that's very exhilarating for me. Have you ever tried reloading, though? Just like, bam, bam, <laughs> hitting it. Uh, but I think my interest in video games kind of mirrors my interest in, in history and art and everything. And I sort of lose interest when you get into the more modern. Right. Uh, so. Okay. That's fine. Okay. Favorite genre though. Uh, Jill, favorite Jill. genre. Oh, did, did you not have a least uh, favorite? Uh, whatever Ben wants to do. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think JP and I are big RPGs. Big RPG fans. Ah, uh, right, yeah. that's number one for both of you? Probably. Okay. Probably. And number one RPG of all time is Fallout New Vegas, probably. Yeah. I love The Witcher 3. No, Witcher's oh. pretty high yeah. up there. There it is. Yeah. Uh, okay, least favorite. Um, I would have to say probably MMO games. I don't know if that's particularly genre. Yeah. Yeah, we'll count it. Um, or what? I was thinking like uh, strategy. It's funny. I actually have like a, a favorite game in almost every genre. You know, like I, I like yeah. 2K in sports. Okay. I, I it So... Yeah, I don't know. I'm pretty I'm pretty well versed, I would say. All right, real <laughs> braggart here. We should have yeah. done back of the box trivia with that kind of <laughs> Dude, I was saying I, I wouldn't mind a little oh, back really? of the box, but you know. Too late now, so buddy. Come in for another term. Uh-huh. <laughs> One more term. <laughs> uh Sergio Jr. says, What video game uh you ever thought about uh, what video game have, did you want to get into but always felt intimidated to try? I was talking to Jill about this morning, um, this this morning, and uh I would have to say probably Final Fantasy. You really? Know, like okay. I, I've always played Western RPGs, and it's just like I think like the sprawling narrative and like the alienish elements of it. You know, alienish. Just, alienish. What are you talking what are you about? Ta- yeah, I. It just it. It's probably something I should play, but uh, I haven't jumped in. Have, have you? Are you? Have you dabbled? Hanson? Yeah, I'm the opposite. Where yeah. I really only like Japanese Got RPGs you. and the Western Got ones. You. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh. Kind of gross me out. Uh huh. But uh, yeah, I mean, we had this email a little while ago on the podcast about like uh oh, what's the best pharmacy to get into and i think i think like 10 hd is a pretty good entry okay. point that okay. seems to be it's gonna feel a little antiquated in some spots uh-huh. but you'll get some of the ideas they're going yeah. for i feel like All yeah right. uh, uh joe what do you think yeah intimidating is a weird word yeah um, you don't get intimidated by genres I don't or get games intimidated that 
What about that strategy nonsense? I actually jumped into Banner Saga because it, it was like strategy games are not usually something that I'm like, oh, I'm so excited. Yeah. And I jumped in. It was so fantastic. Oh, good. Um, wow. So no fear. I have no fear. Fearless. Jeez, I'm fearless. very impressed. Unless it's sharks. Yep. Okay. Uh, you should check out Subnautica. Uh, <laughs> Moses Price writes in, and simple question, best protagonist in gaming. This one's hard. I actually... I, I have, like how you led with the simplest question ever. <laughs> that was nice. I love. I was telling Jill, I love Nico Bellic from Grand Theft Auto. Number Ford. one. Yeah. Just like his voice, his delivery. Yes. All the of the way above. he like sued Rockstar no, I was for telling money. Jill, when I get back home, me and my brother, we quote this game all the time. But there's this line, he's like, Sadavo Baratzaru, when he first gets off the boat. And the guy's <laughs> like, what? He's like, he's like, what? You don't know, remember your language? He's like, Kabuzi? I don't know. Forget it. You know, you'll learn English. <laughs> we needed you last week on the podcast. We were oh, yeah. asked to quote Nico Bellic. Dude, and you just I, did I, it, I got man. it. I got it. Film event. Just yeah. cut, this, cut this back in. Go back okay. in time. Yeah, I think that's the way podcasts work. <laughs> Number one protagonist. What do you got, Jill? Oh, man. I think the, uh, the hard thing about this question is so many of my favorite protagonists are silent. <sighs> so I think the player... That's bum, the bum, bum. worst. I'm going to walk off this set. The player. I told um, her. No, that no, sucks. It's great. No, because uh, like uh, just people that put you in situations uh, that really question, like make you question yourself. Okay. So I really think back to like Kratos and God of War when I uh, put a helpless and caged man into the fire to further my goals okay i remember that yeah that was a that was a good protagonist moment but i don't know if i would say kratos is the best protagonist <laughs> even with the new god of war oh he, i mean love god of war okay all right nothing against god of war but all right that it's an impossible question all right andrew lean much easier question here we go favorite restaurant of all time of all time restaurant favorite all restaurant time? You were just talking about one. Wait, no, it was you, wasn't no, it? No, no, I the, the curry pizza. Yeah, what is this? Curry pizza? Oh, uh, it's fantastic. Where is this? Uh, I live in the Bay Area and uh, have a great deal of food choices. And basically, this place by my apartment has pizza that it's, <laughs> you could, yeah. It's What's just, the name of it? It's curry pizza. Oh, it's just called it's curry called pizza. Curry okay, pizza. got it. Uh, and it's just any curry or thing you could order in a curry shop but in pizza form indian curry yeah so That's good so amazing god i want it uh and you're going I, with I arby's think I can, uh, yeah okay great yeah. choice uh jack <laughs> kearney we're not asking for any ass kissing here but just wondering uh if you have a favorite episode of replay or super replay uh, or if you watch any of the no, nonsense I recently before you jumped, got here i um i watched um i don't know if it was prince of persia 2 but it was definitely a Prince of Persia. Okay. Um, that was the best. It was the best. They talk <laughs> about Arby's, I think. Oh, yeah. Wait, really? Yeah. Oh, that's really weird. Um, And it just, it, it's always great to watch those when you get nostalgic again. Because I hadn't thought about Prince of Persia in a long time. Right. And then you can jump in the comments and say, these idiots need to shut up and show some respect to these cutscenes <laughs> and stop talking over it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Jack Kearney. Man, he really is nailing it with all these questions. He's saying... What were we doing before this? And was this an easy transition for you or a hard one to come to Game Informer? Uh, well, I had just graduated college December 2017, so I was doing the old waiting tables thing. Oh, neat. Um, yeah, right. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. This actually was kind of hard to jump into, definitely, because like, I had, for like eight months, I'd just been waiting tables, not very mentally exhaustive. You know, I'd been trying to write, but it's hard when you don't actually have deadlines. Right. You know? Um, so coming here, I mean, there was a lot more pressure, um, but I mean, to some extent that's good. And like, I was just talking to Reeves about, it, he's like, you know, you got to have internal pressure, you know, you got to develop that. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It was, it was challenging to say the least. To make the transition or once you're here, even do you think it was just challenging? Uh, oh, like transition, just like moving out here. I don't know. More so like getting in the rhythm of like, oh, I guess there's writing deadlines. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I would say that was difficult, but I mean, we've definitely grown. I would say, uh, like, you know, like the speed of it, I, I think I wasn't as prepared for, you know, right. you, you tend to, when you write, you know, you can be a perfectionist quality over quantity, but like here it's like, you know, quality is obviously important, 
But uh, but for news stories in particular, it's for, like for don't news overthink stories in it. particular. Just get them out, you know. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, it is. Is that tough balance for sure? By the way, I like the idea that you worked at a restaurant and mm. that restaurant's name didn't immediately leap to mind. We're talking about favorite <laughs> oh, restaurants. Oh come on, dude! Not a chance. <laughs> Are you going back there? <laughs> no, I don't think so. <laughs> what restaurant was it? Give it a shout out. Uh, shout out to Magone Italian Grill and Pizza, uh, Chapel In, Hill, North Carolina. There we go, North Carolina. Yes, sir. Uh, tough transition, Jill. Uh, yeah. I mean. Not as much as you would think, because I did, like I touched on this a little earlier, I was 10 years in the museum field, uh, and I just got inspired to sort of follow dreams and see what I could make of it, and, uh, you know, working in one office to another is not that different, so I think I had a little easier time with deadlines and that sort of pressure yeah uh, i think some of the weirdest things for me were like wearing jeans to work was really weird for Wait, a you normally wear like a dress yeah like dress though? dress situations in case donors came by <laughs> you can wear uh, a dress if you want here if that really makes you more comfortable i guess um uh, but also things just like being able to look at video games and look at interesting things and doing research and being on twitter and that sort of thing and not uh, feeling like I was going to get fired immediately for doing oh, that. Oh, interesting. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. If you look at anything other than video games here, yeah, we will kick mm. any interns' <laughs> ass out of here. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, okay, Angel Johnson, kind of related question, maybe. Most surprising thing about the job? Angel says, I know it's mm. an old tired question, but I'm always curious. Maybe like biggest surprise, like coming in even, you know, like what were the first, like, oh, Game Informer's more like this than I expected. Uh, well, it's not like... Willy Wonka's chocolate factory for video games. Right, right, right. I, I thought people would be playing games constantly here. I thought there'd be consoles set up around the room. You could just, yeah, play a game and then write about it. But High score competition over here at 2 yeah, o'clock, bro. Yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, people will be gaming at their desks, but, like, I mean, at least for us interns down in the dungeon, uh, we're not, you know, we, we're just, we're writing for the most part. Yeah, but it, it is not that often that someone's playing video games. Like, no, it's really not. At their not. desk, like, maybe, it, if maybe they need two out to. of five days yeah, a week or something. Yeah. So see that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I think similar similar vein is just, um, yeah, I, I played more, but a lot less of every game that I played here, just because you do have that, like, get it done, get it out um, uh -huh. kind of thing. So you get to... You get to play a little bit, and then you have to work. <laughs> right, right. Like, what were you playing at work then? Are you just messing around with the VR stuff, or what are you, what are you talking about? Uh, so I'm very proud of uh, the previews that I got to do. It was one of the most fun things okay. uh, that I got to be involved with, and yeah. just like getting to play these things and getting a feel for them, but not finishing them kills me. Yeah. What uh, can you talk about? Any are they are they oh, out yeah. there? Okay. Um. So I think. Feudal Alloy was is very near and dear to my heart. I got to talk with the developers, and they were just lovely people. Too. And what is this game? Uh, it is, it's a platformer that's set in like the medieval times, but you play as a robot controlled by a fish. Cool. All right. <laughs> All right, have you seen it? It's the fish bowl robot head. Oh, it's so good. No, I okay. think that's a Time Splitters character, but sure. There you go. There, that is. Hey, I okay. like Time Splitters. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yeah, it was just it was a really fun amazing time and, and I played it uh, for the preview and I kept going like I'm going to go back to that I'm going to finish I'm going to get all the way through. Yeah. But then other things jump in. Did you guys take along for any Game Informer editors previews or features or anything? I did actually. For um, which one? Underworld Ascendant. Oh yeah. Yeah, that was really cool. What was that uh, like? Uh, awesome. I think I was going to say that was probably my favorite experience here as far as like professional capacity because uh, Minicade was really awesome. Oh, wow. Um, but uh, it was called Minicade, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, yeah, me and uh, Marky Afava, we got to preview. We met Joe Fielder who like wrote for Bioshock Infinite. Right. Um, and he was, I believe, like, you know, narrative uh, designer. I don't know his official title, but he, you know, came and previewed the game with us. Um, and that was really cool because like I'm into I didn't know what like an immersive sim was at the time I had yeah. to learn what that was but uh, learning the history of looking glass and stuff and like I love Fallout and I love Bioshock Infinite so um, playing that game was really cool and I had I had fun with it when does that came out uh, it came out oh it, it already came out oh god okay yeah uh, for Steam I believe it hasn't come out for consoles yet it's coming out on consoles sometime in 2019 okay so Underworld is like 
the inspiration for a lot of those folks that love immersive sims. Mm-hmm. Like every time you interview Arcane about Dishonored or anything, like they'll, they'll always go back to there like, go. oh my gosh, Underworld, like the original Underworld, just incredible. Yeah. Ultima Underworld, I guess. Ultima Underworld. Technically yep. said. Yep, yep. But cool. Have you seen the reception for that game? Is it okay? I don't know. Uh, about you know, I, I, read, I read one review. Like when I, my preview, I, I actually had fun with the game. Yeah. You know, um, so I, I, I said, you know, pretty much positive things about it. But I, I read one review and the guy didn't seem to care for it. Do your own research, everybody. <laughs> Sorry, we're more informative. Uh, Jacob Geller, former Game Informer intern, yeah. so he knows okay. the ropes here. He says, hey, how'd you all leverage the clout mm. of working at Game Informer? Yeah. Did you email creators you never would have otherwise? That old clout. Did, did you dazzle anyone in your online communities? Uh-huh. Leveraging clout. I yeah. I don't know if I would... S- it doesn't feel that way. Mm-hmm. Um, but it does open pathways that you wouldn't before. Um, I did get to talk to developers. I got to play... Uh, Tetris Effect with the developers. And oh, yeah. You got to meet Mizuguchi. Oh, man. That's cool. Super. Mm. Uh, I cannot stress how stressful that is with the developers watching you play because you're like it's tetris you know i've got right, this and right. you walk in and you're like all of a sudden i have no idea what tetris is because you can just feel their eyeballs On burning at the back of your head yeah. like this person needs to give me input and we just your brain is <laughs> so nervous you can't generate input or output that's the problem mm-hmm. oh that's stressful okay so that's good got get to meet mizuguchi that's good yeah clout. no absolutely fun did you get to like reach out to any developers, JP? Oh, uh, you, you know, I was to... trying to leverage that clout, man. Um, but uh, God Howard is a little bit <laughs> yeah. too high on the page. It's a struggle right? for us uh, to even get that. I reached out to Sonic Fox, uh, the old uh, spo- e sports gamer yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. winner. I uh, didn't get didn't hear back from him. So oh, Sonic, man. if you're if you're listening, I'm yeah. still up for that interview. I think some of the things um, too are um, like community get like having people follow me on Twitter. Okay, and, yeah, like, that, that was cool. Um, I think there were. Like, there was an amazing moment earlier this week mm. uh, where Brian Intahar retweeted one of my news stories, and no I was just way. like, pinch myself. <laughs> it's insomnia, <laughs> Spider-Man, creative director. That's yeah, super yeah. cool. Uh, okay, a little bit on the relation with the community and stuff. Bracken Floyd says, what's the article you wrote in an ironic or satirical fashion that got the biggest reaction from people who clearly didn't read the article? Oh, boy. I, I Man, I just did this article, uh, and it's been mixed. It, it was kind of a joke. So initially, I wanted to do with the editors uh, what characters we want to see in Smash Bros. DLC. Right. And I got a bunch of ironic responses. So Juba's like, Ronald oh. McDonald and RoboCop. Oh, and no. I'm like, ah, oh, you know what? Hey, you know, this is an angle. I can, I can be funny with it. But the problem was, editor also shot me serious responses like some people wanted to see leon kennedy right um so i made this story and some people were just not happy about it they were like because i put ronald mcdonald as like a character we'd like to see and you know people are serious about their smash so. yeah don't mess with smash don't JP. don't mess was, with it was uh, lesson learned that article. yeah that yeah. was outrageous yeah <laughs> Do you guys read all the comments in your news stories? uh i do uh this last one i, I kind of stopped i yeah. mean some people got the joke uh, <laughs> others not so much yeah <laughs> i yeah i try to absolutely Okay. Did you learn anything? Um, I think there are, like, some people I like to engage with and some people that I don't. Just like real life. Some <laughs> some good apples, some bad mm-hmm. apples. Uh-huh, but uh, mostly for, like, 99.9% you, you know of who, it's, okay. it's good. Uh, one guy got a shout-out by the last batch of interns, Zangmaster. Yeah. That guy's a champ. That guy's All a right. champ. I like Zangmaster him. rules. Yeah. Uh, Dominic Sochoki, uh says, out of how many ideas you had for articles at GI, how many got written or published? Like, Point one percent. What is that process like? It's oh. it's hard. It yeah. is. It is. That's like the hardest part is pitching. I mean, not really coming up with ideas. I'd say is pretty hard. I mean, maybe it comes naturally to some people, but coming up with ideas and pitching. Pitching is I tough. Just like vomit ideas. Right, but, and then it's just, well, we did that, or that sounds like yeah. this, or let's rope this into that. Any number of reasons. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's frustrating. And then sometimes you get far into the process too of just like this is working, and then. For whatever reason, you didn't get that part of the article you thought you were going to, or something happens, it just doesn't come together, and that's so heartbreaking. Yeah, it is definitely, I'm, I'm sure you both experienced this, but a big recurring theme with interns is always just like, boy, you can really get beaten down by like pitches <laughs> not going through, or even like I don't when it's it. going through edits, then it's like, oh my God, why is Miller going on for 45 minutes about editing? Really? <laughs> you know, edits was okay for me. Okay. Edits was okay. Uh, so, uh, you'd get, you know, you get ripped apart every once in a while, but... Uh, on the page, not in person, oh, I hope. Oh man, I <laughs> a little think... Both. Oh, okay. Yeah. One of the most intense, I just did a Kingdom Hearts piece, and um, Kim had to be on that because she is a big right. Kingdom Hearts fan and it's just like 
Oh, man. Just like the amount of edits? The amount of edits and just like trying to get it nailed down because the sim- for simplicity's sake, trying to figure out how to say that. And she was big shout out to Kim. She was so fantastic and so willing to help me, especially when she was busy herself uh-huh. with the crazy things. Um, it was an intense back and forth process. But you got it done. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> what uh, What were your favorite features or articles if you could point somebody to one thing i could say speaking of kim i I wrote like kind of a longer piece on the evolution of fallout um and she helped me out a lot with that piece Uh, she gave me some great feedback so it's just like you know a piece detailing how the series has changed from like its roots in the original wasteland game yeah and then you know all the way up to fallout 76 when it returns to being a wasteland (laughs) heyo uh if people wanted to search for it how would they find that uh, just uh, Google the evolution of Fallout. I'm pretty sure you'd find it. There we go. Game Informer, cool. Yeah. What's your number one feature? Uh, I have to go with Feudal Alloy just for like the process and and talking with these people who are really passionate and sort of doing the same thing I was in a way because yeah. I'd quit everything and gone off to do my passion and um that and I just got to kind of do a little more than your average. Um, right. I think the most fun I had was my redheads piece because I got to uh, play a little back and forth with Kyle, um, who is a champ. <laughs> Real so champ sorry, in the redhead Kyle. community. Thank you so much. Gingers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Sorry. Um, I feel like he takes things so well, and I have such great admiration for him. No I one takes make crap that like a Kyle. I, I wanted to make that, that clear. Absolutely <laughs> love him. That's sweet. And so if people want to find your piece, they would search Futile Aloy. How, how do you, how do, you do this? Feudal. Feudal. So it's the opposite of like fuel, because I would write fuel to begin with. Okay. <clears throat> Feudal Alloy. Alloy. Uh, Got it. Okay, sweet. Uh, hey, Tim Turry of PlayStation fame now. What? Writes in and says, what type of person did you guys think Ben Reeves was when you started? And what do you think of Ben Reeves after three months? Uh, Tim just cutting right to it. I yeah. think he's a lot more serious than yes. I was expecting. Because uh-huh. on the uh, his personality um, behind the camera is very jokey and very uh, funny man, but... <laughs> Like, it's not anywhere to be seen I, when you I got deadlines. I have no idea how to make him laugh or smile. Oh, I can barely do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've worked with him for eight years. No idea. He, it's it's his face, his resting face is a weird one. Mm. He's a beautiful <laughs> looking man, just gorgeous. Yeah, absolutely. But at the same time, it's like, is he angry? <laughs> like, developers in particular, I think, have a tough time with it. It's like, why isn't he showing an expression while playing this game? Then afterwards, would be like, oh, no, I liked it. Mm. But it's like, what? Gives it's nothing. not quite the resting face thing mm-hmm. but there's something there where oh, it's tough to read that incredible dude. poker face yes yeah. I, gee, yeah now that i think about it i've never played poker i, with I Reeves, would never but i would want never to. want to yeah. do it because he's either the silliest person on earth yeah or it's like is this super serious because he has the same facial expression yeah. for both he needs here's what he needs you know like that uh bob dylan harmonica strap <laughs> thing he needs that but it just needs to have a mirror <laughs> on it so he can just get a read on his facial yeah, expressions yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, Jack Myers says, who is your favorite coworker other than Leo and I? Uh, Leo and you guys? Uh-huh. Great. Great. Classics. Yeah, you got it. Uh, yeah, moving on. Yeah, no. Um, I don't know, Joe. What, what do you think? Well, I mean, JP and I are basically, there are long stretches of time where we're the only ones that yeah, see that's each very other. Yeah, that's very true. That's very true. We're in the third trenches. Floor we're in the weird trenches. Floor. Yeah, yeah, it's a weird floor. So, like, I don't want to get too schmoozy, but not really. I really That's appreciate the yeah. with you. Thing I've ever there you heard. go. We got along. We were talking about it. She's we very have upbeat. We such a weird mix. Yeah. I'm very, I'm very like subdued. Oh, uh, putting it like lightly. Even killed. Even killed. Yeah. yeah. Regular odd couple. I would come in and there be like, go. JV, I'm so excited. That that happened a lot. I hadn't <laughs> had my coffee. I'm like, yep. How's right, it going? Right, right. I yeah. smell a future podcast between you. <laughs> <laughs> so. yeah. uh, Jeff Flynn says, "Who is someone at the GI office that isn't public facing, like not an editor?" Oh. I.e. not an editor, like accounting or whatever, who you'd want to give public recognition. Sarah. Oh, um, wow. Interesting. Sarah, cool. I actually, I, I don't know who she is, but Mags, <laughs> Mags would hit, she would hit me up on Slack. Margaret, and we'd yeah. have some Margaret, we'd have some, uh, some hilarious conversations about games. She would give me ideas, you know, when I'm like, throwing ideas out of the editors like give me right. examples she would give me some good examples so. oh that's great margaret is the person who's the smartest person in the game former staff mm. uh and she's the one who made the hats as well for Excel, i thought if so. you remember that yeah yeah, yeah she's very talented yeah. uh sarah is uh at reception yes yes and she helped out a lot with the extra she's life shipping and everything literally mm-hmm. like there the first day the first 
face you meet. She's yeah. always there to be helpful and like help you get through things. If you, whatever you need, she finds. It's true. And the thing that's always nice is there's never any pissiness. It's always like, oh, Sarah, I need to ship out this guitar six different ways to Sunday for extra life. And it's just like, yep, no problem. Mm -hmm. I would be so angry about doing all those things. <laughs> so I'm always amazed by that. Uh, Angel Johnson wants to know funniest moment. Funniest moment. Joe, uh, do you have something? I do. But it's not like something that happened in uh, the office. We <laughs> Just were... you were watching TV at home last night? No, <laughs> like we were all playing uh, tabletops. Oh, uh, yeah. Avalon. And yeah, Avalon, Avalon, of course, yeah. Joe Juba <laughs> calling me the meanest things was the best. Joe was, was on so a good. rampage saying Joe was evil in, in <laughs> that Avalon. Was, that was intense. Oh, it was so, I loved it. Yeah. Yeah, and then at the end it turns out... I was evil. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. okay. No, oh. actually that first time he was oh. so convinced. It was like, Jill, you're such a bad liar. Yeah. You're so evil. And I was a good person. <laughs> it's such a crappy <laughs> move to do I, I remember, okay, my, you know what was the funniest moment for me? And I remember laughing about this was like that? Leo did a little Naruto shout out at the at the game that that, that gave me a good laugh Wait, yeah, i remember which, that when we were at the tabletop i can't remember it but he was like <laughs> something like he was like naruto taught me or, yeah <laughs> as naruto I'm, I'm gonna steal it honestly <laughs> naruto Wait, because you're a big naruto fan i am a big naruto fan naruto okay. yeah yeah what's the best naruto game uh probably the I, I haven't really played any of them but i have watched uh youtube clips of the like the, the the third one where the number one fan this guy Jill <laughs> come on Jeez, you know, so I watch the show uh -huh. <laughs> okay sorry but YouTube clips of something something yeah it's uh the third one it's like the third fighting game like you know it's like the I don't know Leo do you know what I'm talking about here okay Leo's <laughs> yeah. a poser completely yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Tony Stickle has a very important question JP you look just like a guy that went to my high school are you that guy <laughs> Tony Stickler yeah Tony Stickle Stickle I don't re I don't know any Tonys. I have a twin brother, though, so it's very possible. Oh, so if, he if, probably went to school with Tony If Stickle. you went to Jordan High School, there's a good chance. What, uh, what does your twin brother do with his facial hair? Because you have very unique facial hair. I do, right? The scraggly, yeah. Uh, yeah, spotty. Yeah. yeah uh, you know, we shave it every now and again. I don't know. He you does... sync it up? No, nah, we don't sync it up because okay. we have to look different somehow. We're fraternal yeah. twins, but we still look too similar. Yeah, All right. That's uh, a struggle. Mm. It's yeah. true. Jeff Flynn wants to know, what does Andy smell like? I bet he smells like leadership and printer ink. <laughs> Sounds about right. I don't know, but he almost ran me over with his car this morning. <laughs> <laughs> did he give you a wave of friendly? He did. It was oh, the God. friendliest, yeah. almost near-death experience I've ever had. Yeah. Did you get any words of advice? We're about to have our pizza party, so maybe yeah. Andy will dish it then. But maybe. did you learn anything from Andy? Seeing him run through the office every once in a while, darting there and that. You know what? He is actually so sweet. Mm -hmm. um, I That's think true. I ran into him right after Thanksgiving and I was really homesick mm. and he like sat there and was so polite and like listened to me blabber on about how I miss my cat and my husband <laughs> and, and like he was really taking it seriously oh, and nice. sharing some stories and and then he locked the doors and said you can't leave he ran up the stairs as quickly as possible yep all right that sounds fair <laughs> uh let's see rookie spooky yeah. wants to know where would you like to go from here I, to I, the top. I, <laughs> there you go. President Straight of the United the States. Oh, yeah. Let's uh, do it. I don't know. I'm thinking uh, I, I was going to, you know, shoot the breeze. I'm going to try and uh, do some freelancing after this. Okay. Um, we'll see where it goes. I don't know. I mean, this was a, it was a tough internship. So I definitely, you know, uh, learned that maybe it's not for me because the pressure is real. Uh, yeah. But I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm definitely going to keep trying. We'll, we'll see where it goes. You seem interested in doing some more videos in the future. I, right I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because. Uh, <laughs> Not to cast any shade your way. Please. It seems a bit easier. Uh, oh, yeah. look at this. Do you hear this, Leo? Uh, My God. Uh, I mean, yeah, oh, writing sucks great. if that's what you mean. That is yeah. what I mean. <laughs> okay. That is what I mean. Yeah. I, you know, just being able to freewheel, you know, just well, like. Well, there takes a little I bit know, of tech hurdles I, before you get to the freewheeling point. But I know. What do I know? No, look, you're absolutely right. I'd rather yeah. talking to a microphone than write something. <laughs> God. Uh, so, yeah, talk a little go. about video. You go. Go. Yeah, yeah, you know, do some YouTube videos, some video game related stuff. And you said culture. you wanted to take the bold track of being cynical when talking about games. Possibly. I'm a naturally cynical person. So, uh -huh. you know, if I'm watching a movie or, or some terrible commercial, I naturally just like act cynical you this know, sounds like the medicine the world it. needs right now yeah that's we all need more of that so i don't know maybe i'll try and balance it out we'll no see. if you have any questions in the future definitely let me know sure uh jill what do you want to do other than go to the top of everything mm. um 
I think there are two answers. The The practical answer is freelance and try that and see how it goes. Uh, but I started out as a Game Informer fan, obviously. Like, how'd you get into it? How'd I get into Game Informer? Yeah. Uh, I think my parents. I was very young. And they're like, I don't know anything about this gaming thing. Uh, so here's a magazine. And then I just continuously fed that and i was i was what like 10 at the time so i've been a fan for don't want to date myself probably more than a (laughs) decade that's awesome here's the tough question though how'd you go from the magazine to the website oh that was an easy that was an easy shit it was just like i'm reading game informer i might as well check out it wasn't like one of those ads in the magazine that said like we have a website everybody (laughs) no okay i just you know Checked she just it out. Punched it into Google one day. Yeah, oh, one day. Smart. Checking it yeah. out. That's yeah. very cool. So one day I wanna I wanna come back. I wanna yeah. be a game informer. That's awesome. Well, nice. you two have done an awesome job. Thank you so much Thank for your you. hard work. Leo in the booth. Thank Gotta you. give it up. Uh, but we couldn't we couldn't send you guys off for all the fantastic work you've done without going out on a high note, a real celebration. So to do that, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Introducing freestyle rapper J.P. Pizzy, oh. otherwise known as The White, the white Lion. Lion. Yeah. What, what take it this? away. All right, really crank this, Leo. All right, White Lion, take it away. I just have to freestyle over this. Oh, <laughs> chilling out with Hanson. He thinks he's handsome. I got these bars in tandem. It's my anthem, like I'm jet lagged. I'm about to take off with the bag. Yo, I put him in crags. I toss the frag, I got the last laugh up in the cash cab. They blast back. Yo. <laughs> Alright. <laughs> That's it. What line, yeah, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you. Thank you. He did not know that was coming. No, that is wow. very impressive. Jill, you were in on this? I had no idea. Wow. No, I remember the Jackbox party pack. Man, you I was afraid of this. I was that. I was dreading this. <laughs> honestly. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Right. Excellent work. And thank you so much for watching or listening. Remember, we'll have another new episode next week, even though it's going to be over the holidays. We'll have a fun episode waiting for you. But thank you so much for watching or listening. And be sure to tune in next week when we have that new episode waiting for you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.